Uh, I would like to call the select board meeting to order. Let us stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you everyone. Welcome to the select board meeting, Tuesday, February 4. Uh, is there anyone that would like to share ideas, opinions, or ask questions about town government? Hearing none, moving on. Staff appointments. Tonight the board will consider affirming the town manager's appointment of Kaylin Chanel and Aaron Basler as senior library assistants. Mr. Kamalu. Yeah, quickly through the chair, I am respectfully asking the board to affirm the appointment of Kylene uh, Chanel. Uh, where is Kylene? Yeah. Is it Kaylin? Kaylin. Kaylin. Yes. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> Kaylin. Uh, she's joining the town with four years of experience working in the children's services um, department as a children's services librarian for the Bolton Public Library. Uh, she also uh, was the sales and marketing associate for Barefoot Books, Cambridge, Beacon Press, Boston for one and a half years. Uh, also the book floor associate at Barnes & Noble. Uh, she has a BA in writing with a minor in cultural anthropology, great anthropology. <laughs> And MA in writing, literature, and publishing from the Emerson College. Uh, when we spoke uh, with your references, they told us that you are always willing to take on new challenges. And quite frankly, it is going to be a very exciting challenge here in Hopkinton. Uh, you have uh, experience working in a busy library, uh, dealing with patrons uh, effectively. Um, you also do this with grace and charm. Uh, that's what we were told. Uh, you have very strong technical skills and were described as a fantastic team member who is bright, positive, outgoing, and a very flexible problem solver. That's Caitlin. Move on. All right. So, well, hold up, Mr. Kamalo. Um, so, Kaylin, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, stuff Mr. Kamalo hasn't, and then we will, uh, if the board has any questions, we'll hit you with a que one question each, and then we'll move on. Okay. Um, yep, I've been the children's librarian at the Bolton Public Library for just over five years now. Um, I live in Menden with my husband and our two daughters and our three cats and our three chickens. <laughs> and um, so I, I'm excited for this opportunity because I'll be a lot closer to home. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful library, so I'm very much looking forward to this next step. Great. Uh, Mary Jo, do you have anything? Yeah, I just want to ask, what, what sort of programs for children would you initiate? Uh, I put a lot of work into the summer reading program, and which I've been building, and we have a lot more kids coming and participating every summer, so that's a lot of fun. So that's a big part of my job. Um, a lot of craft programs, STEM programs, family movies, uh, maker days, part of the big maker movement, getting families together just to create using different types of materials. Do we still have the story hour program? Yes, um, okay. we have. In fact, we've just expanded it. We've shifted one of them from a toddler to a baby story time, so that we're starting oh. water range pages. I always enjoyed that yes. <laughs> with my kids. So. Yeah. Thank you. So I guess Bolton's loss is our gain. <laughs> uh, any uh, any particular achievements at the Bolton Library that uh, you'd want to initiate here? Uh, it will be, uh, since I'll be a senior library assistant here, uh, and not in children's services per se, um, I hope to bring uh, my skills in reader's advisory to this job. You know, I'm well read in children's literature, young adult, and adult fiction, so I think that that will serve me well in my new position. Excellent. Making recommendations. Good you know. Uh, I, I just want to say I'm so glad that you picked Hopkinton because my, my, my wife for the last few years after we opened the new library kept saying, okay, 
So when are we, when are we going to expand the uh, weekend hours? How about Sundays? I want to go there on Sundays. The kids want to go there on Sundays. So I'm, I'm just, you know, just thank you for, for, for staffing it up. I'm really glad that you, uh, you're you working well with the budget and so that we're able to expand the hours and use that gem that we have across the street. So really, thank you. I, I see your resume right here and, and your cover letter. You've covered everything that we're already asking. So thanks so much. So my senior parliamentarian, Mr. Hur, is a little under the weather tonight. So uh, normally banish me to the end of the table. Normally he likes to, <laughs> normally he, <laughs> normally likes to talk, but uh, we're cutting him off today. So you have anything? If you don't have anything, I'm good. It's okay. great. I'm good well, too. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Basler. Yes, sir. Basler oh, with ba an S. S. Okay. Mr. Kamala. Yes. Uh, welcome, Erin. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, um, she has worked for the another beautiful library, was the li library for two years, as the assistant circulation librarian. Uh, three years you have been a freelancer. Uh, you were a freelancer for the uh, uh, Telegram and Gazette. Uh, and also uh, you volunteered for one year uh, for the Atleboro Public Library. That's correct. Uh, you have a BA in English from the Worcester State University. Uh, you are currently working on your master's in library science at Simmons University. Mm -hmm. uh, your references uh, cited your excellent customer skills. Uh, you are person they described you as personable, professional, and approachable. Um, they also spoke highly of your uh, experience developing professional communication skills. Uh, noting that you have done so effectively with diverse communities uh, and that you don't get easily flustered or stressed <coughs> when library is busy. We will keep you busy here. <laughs> mm -hmm. I look forward to it. Good. So, Erin, why don't you same thing? Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, I have worked for the Wellesley Free Library in their circulation department as of now three years, actually, this coming month. Um, I have had wonderful experiences uh, working not just at the main library, but at the two branches where I get to uh, experience a variety in patron diversity from very small, age, small children to uh, elderly patrons to young adults to parent-aged uh, individuals. Uh, I have helped at my time at the Attleboro Public Library volunteering. I had the pleasure of aiding the children's department in creating summer teen programs and helping to run them uh, that were well received by uh, the population as a whole. And as you said, I have worked as a freelance reporter for, an, for a number of years, which has given me a lot of wonderful opportunities to interact again with a wide variety of individuals, learn their stories, and learn how best to approach every single situation with patience and an open ear and, and an open heart. Excellent. Mr. Nasrullah, would you like to start us? Yes, so I see that you're um, a freelance co uh, correspondent with the TNG. You're still, still doing that? Yes, sir. I'm also doing it uh, 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 replicating the police and fire logs with the landmark as of this a uh, few months ago. Excellent. And the new Worcester spy. <laughs> <laughs> Could you elaborate, please? Uh, that yes. Something that... with your police logs. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Uh, the new Worcester spy was my college newspaper okay. that I also wrote a uh, college newspaper website that I also wrote articles for them in my time at college. Excellent. Great, thank you. Do you know? Actually, I, I, I don't have any Good. questions. Your, your resume looks good. I, I just want to ask uh, Mr. Kamalo and Heather one of Mr. Hur's questions. I just want to make sure. And then please don't take it the wrong way, as he always says. Are we budgeted for, for these two positions and everything's good and we're going to be okay? These, these positions were budgeted for in a previously approved FY budget. This is a new headcount under the upcoming budget. Beautiful. There you go. Hi. <laughs> Congratulations on going for your master's at Simmons. I mean, Simmons is the library school to go to. It's fabulous. One of my patrons actually recommended that I apply, and I've enjoyed my time there immensely. Oh, I imagine you yeah, have. It's wonderful. It's cool. 
just what what can you bring to the citizens as they come to the library? Well, uh, what can't I bring? I've got a lot of enthusiasm. Um, I love I love to be helpful in any way I can. If a patron is coming in looking for a specific book, if they're looking for a recommendation, if they just if they need assistance. Uh, in, in knowing in knowing where to, uh, where to go, I'm happy to help in any way I can. I'm also very good at not taking things personally when a patron comes in with is in and is in a bad mood or is having a bad day. I just fig I figure the best way that I can handle customer service in this manner is to meet them with as welcoming a de disposition as possible. And, and fulfill, fulfill my duties as best I can. I like to interact with absolutely everyone that I meet, and I have a lot of wonderful ideas to um, leave patrons feeling satisfied as they leave. Thank you. All right, so uh, Mr. Kamala, what do you need from us? Motion to affirm the town money's appointment of uh, Kaylin Chanel and Erin Besla. So I'd like to make a motion to affirm the town manager's appointment of, of both uh, Caitlin and Erin as senior library assistants. Second. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed and abstain? Carries. Thank you. All go on board. Thank you. Welcome. So I just wanted to take a quick moment um, to touch base on uh, something that happened in the community this week that I, I meant to, to speak at for a public forum, but I didn't. Um, <clears throat> so today I was at a funeral for a good friend of mine's um, five-year-old daughter, who it was the second of his twin daughters that passed away. Uh, in three months and um, the Masters family they live in town they've been in town they're a great family and it was really nice to see the outpouring um, of support for people from the town as well as uh, their extended family and um, all of their <coughs> their lifelong friends Chris and I kind of share a bond uh, in the hockey community. And um, he got up there today and did a, about a 10, 15 minute eulogy on his daughter with the slideshow going behind him. Um, it kind of puts a whole lot of things into perspective, the Republican versus Democrat garbage. Uh, and everything that goes on, it's, uh, it's all small stuff. And when stuff like this comes up, uh, as sad as it was, and it was sad, um, it was really nice to see that it, we, were, we had it at Faith Community Church and it was uh, the church was bursting at the seams and there was not a dry eye in the house Chris gave Chris and Jenny uh, two of the toughest uh, people that I've ever gotten to know and love uh, they did a, a, a knockdown job they did their own eulogy for their daughter which um, People who know me know that I pride on being a relatively tough person. That brings toughness to a whole second level, seeing, seeing him and, uh, and Jenny do that. So uh, I wanted to kind of to recognize the town for coming together and, and, and uh, supporting them and let them know <coughs> that we as a town will remain here and we'll always support them um, as well as any member in the, of the town. But, uh, obviously, it's a very emotional time right now for many, and um, you know, our, our hearts go out to the Masters family. And um, I'm going to stop there because I'm not going to start crying again. Um, but Chris and Jenny and and, uh, and the rest, we think we think very highly of you, and uh, stay strong. So that said, let's move on to we have a uh, consent agenda. The consent agenda, <coughs> agenda items are to approve the January 21 minutes and accept the resignation of Jim Seriello 
from the Trails Coordination and Management Committee. Would any member like to break the items out for a separate vote? Okay. Do you like to break out the Jim's Go ahead. Okay, so, um, so I would request a motion to approve the uh, minutes. The minutes. So moved. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Yeah, I just wanted to just take a second just to thank Jim. Jim's been uh, involved in uh, in a, a lot of committees, and really, um, he was on Zach with me for several years, and uh, he's a great contributor, and really has done a great job. And I just want to make sure that uh, we thank Jim and and uh, uh, wish him the best. Thank you. All right. So I'd like to make a motion to accept his resignation. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstain, it carries, thank you. Parade permit, uh, Michael Liznow Respite Center, Harvest Ride for Respite. The board will consider an application for a parade permit from the Michael Liznow Center for a Bike Ride Fundraiser on Saturday, September 26th, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., beginning and ending at the Elmwood School. There will be 28, 50, and 100 mile course rides, and there will be no road closures. Any questions from the board members? Mr. Chair. <coughs> Sir, is this a new event for the town, or is this something we've done in the past? In fact, through the chair, um, it's a new event in town, and I think that's why we broke it out from the consent agenda. Got it. Okay. Good. Um, do we have... So, we could have you talk, but I'm going to probably try to just sneak this through so there's less pushback. How's that sound? You all right with that, or do you want to talk about it? All right. Any further discussion from the board? <laughs> hearing, <laughs> hearing none? I got uh, to, well, I do, do I make a motion? Yeah. Yeah. Make a motion to approve a parade permit for the Michael Linzo Respite Center Harvest Ride for Respite bike ride on September 26, 2020. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Quick question. Mr. Masarula. Are your riders full or are you still looking for riders to? Uh, we are looking for yeah. riders. Yeah. It's our first year. So. Excellent. We need riders, community members, anybody yeah, we, you know that wants to ride. We have a lot of riders in town, yeah. so uh, as everybody knows, sure to get the word a wonderful out. cause. Uh, that center down there, you guys do an absolutely wonderful job. I have two cousins that are that are uh, kids down there that work down there, and they're just and awesome. Know, my daughter used to go there. That yeah. was what brought us to Hopkinton yep. seven years ago. Was the respite center? We had the only thing we knew about Hopkinton was the respite center. Yep. So sometimes that's enough. Yep. <laughs> my cousins, uh, Mikey Mullins and Peter Shea. Oh. Are, just the yep. apples I see them every time They're we go in. The best guys. So <laughs> you guys yeah. do a wonderful best job with some kids down there. So, uh, all right. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Motion second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Abstains? Carries. Thank you. Um, we will need to get a signature. I'll, I'll let you explain what so, this is uh, in regards so to. So I'm Mark Walter, and I'm involved. I. Uh, coordinating the routes um, and seeking all the necessary approvals, which will include a permit from MassDOT. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a form that was submitted that will require a signature, so I don't know if we should get that now or is that after, just wanted to tie off that loose end. I would just get with Mr. Kamalu. Okay. Okay. Yep. Great. He'll so make sure it gets to the right hands for signature. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you and good luck. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Moving along. Community Needs Assessment Interface Update. The board will hear an update on the results of the Community Needs Assessment and data from Interface for the first three months of mental health referral service. Abby Rosenberg and Don Al... Does it just Don Miller or Don Alcott Miller? Don Alcott Miller. All right, just Don. <laughs> Don, I'll answer anything. <laughs> it's a pleasure to see you again. Hi. Hi. So um, I just wanted to give a really quick update on the community mental health needs assessment that we, Mental Health Collaborative, did in collaboration with Hopkinton Youth and Family Services um, and Boston Research Group. Um, so we had 40, 480 adult respondents. And um, I think the highlights of what the community members shared um, are just 78% of respondents mentioned stress and anxiety as top mental health challenges. 81% uh, of respondents are very or somewhat interested in learning about mental health, so that's kind of the basis of our program is mental health literacy. And 20%, um, one in five, so they were like 
less likely to ask for help due to stigma and they really want more education so that we can hopefully decrease the stigma. Um, so we're just really excited to offer not just our schools but our community mental health literacy programming for free in Hopkinton. So I'm just excited for that opportunity and wanted to just also say that um, interestingly enough I got a call in my practice today of a woman with a 16 year old who was in tears because no provider has called her back, et cetera, et cetera. I can't, no one takes insurance. And I had the interface, is that what it was yeah, interface card, mm -hmm. and um, gave her the number, and she was so grateful. So I'm really, I'm gonna hand this over, but I'm very, very excited about that Hopkinton has, a, you know, taken on this service. Well, and we're grateful to Abby. Um, she funded the survey. She, you know, um, paid for, um, the community outreach to let folks know what the survey had to say and it's going to be very instrumental in um, youth and family services strategic plans so it's very helpful data to have when I was with you just last Thursday I shared with you about the interface referral service and how 39 residents within three months um, received support through this survey so I won't go over all that again tonight except to say that the bulk of them were kids and we're just really excited that um, in the newspaper on the Hopkinton Independent on February 12th there'll be the insert um, so that everyone who gets a paper will also learn about interface and there'll be a story about interface in the paper on that date as well um, and so the hop um, Coalition, Hopkinton Organizing for Prevention, they're trying different methods, different means, to, you know, every month or so, or every couple of months, to try to get the word out to the community that this resource exists. So um, we're just really pleased to hear that another person got turned yeah. towards it again today. Um, and just as another update from our office, um, we started back in December with suicide prevention training called QPR, Question, Persuade, Refer. And um, the first group that received this training was the first responders in town. So fire, police, and then we invited public health as well because they walk into some situations that can be tricky. And so that, that first training um, for first responders is a three-hour training because they do something very special for them because they're exposed to more trauma than the rest of the population typically. Um, but we're, we're happy that um, moving forward, the senior center and library and the rest of the in town employees will receive a one and a half hour training should they choose. Nobody's forced to attend, it's optional. Um, and QPR is question, persuade, refer. It's like CPR, only it's a way to lead somebody who might be having a mental health challenge to treatment. So it teaches the folks who are trained how to question someone if they're concerned for them, um, how to the persuade, they're trying to change that language. I don't think they ever will because of the catchy nature of the, the P in CPR. But persuade sounds almost manipulative, but it's actually joining them and bringing them to treatment. And the refer is, you know, how to refer someone for help when they need it. Uh, and so it trains residents to be gatekeepers. So our final round of training will be to open up to boards and committees and then the general public. So we've tried to be strategic about how we're rolling out um, QPR and it was through a, an earmark yet a second earmark we got very generously from Senator Spilka's office for mental health um, and prevention around mental health issues so we're really excited to be rolling that out slowly through the community um, and getting word out to people so everyone can be a gatekeeper who wants to be and really all that means is to know what to do when somebody you care about you know you have a question about how they're doing or like you're in the line at the supermarket and should you choose you hear somebody say something that causes you to second guess what they're talking about be able to turn around and say how are you are you okay mm -hmm. and, and that's what most folks communicate they're looking for when they're really hurting somebody just kind of stopping them in their tracks and saying are you okay mm -hmm. and then if they say no knowing what to do beyond that not being as frightened to have that response so that's the updates from our office and what we're doing around mental health and some of the big um, heavy hitting issues about folks really seeking treatment and desperately needing it. Um, we're really pleased within the community that the schools have led the way with really publicizing this and getting this resource into parents' hands. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so it's nice to see, um, so society is kind of turning around and they really are seeing mental health as an illness and they're not alienating people. I, I work as a nurse in the prisons 
and the corrections officers themselves have one of the highest suicide rates. Uh, depression, it's a very testosterone driven environment. Um, and these programs that are getting in there are doing wonderful, wonderful jobs uh, for these inmates, breaking down the barriers of these people actually saying, yes, I'm depressed, yes, I'm upset. Um, and then just, you know, society in general. Um, Metro West Medical Center Natick is now morphing to all mental health and psych. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a service around here that's, that's much, much needed. You know, like around here you have McLean and Mount Auburn and Clinton and Gardner and that's it. So now we're going to have, you know, another whole massive hospital devoted to stuff like that. So. And that is the greatest challenge as services like Riverside, yeah. I mean Riverside, like um, Interface grows, mm -hmm. that there's not enough providers to refer people right. to. And, and, you know, so we need to get the profession flooded with new clinicians yep. <laughs> out there. So. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Oh, okay. does anyone have anything? Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Um, you guys can fight over <laughs> Okay. So I want to thank you for everything you're doing. Um, I saw an episode of Patriot Act on Netflix uh, when they were talking about mental health and actually how difficult it is to get access to mental health services. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not just number of providers, but also insurance and providers being able to take on new patients and, and all of that. So I think it's fabulous that we have something in town that, you, you know, we have the first step. I think we have a long way to go, but I think that what you're doing is fabulous. It's um, if that makes a difference in one person's life, it's worth it. Thank you, Mary Jo. Well, I just wanted to say I have run into you folks out uh, at a couple of events and gotten pamphlets handed to me, and I'm very impressed with your outreach. You're doing a, a wonderful job at trying to get the word out to people. Thanks very much. Yeah, well, you know, as you know, my wife and I are very, very uh, involved with Riverside. And uh, I'm just glad that we're talking two weeks in a row. We're, already, we're talking about you know, mental health. And um, you know, last week was the uh, budget and everything. But this week, you know, and be, you know when you started doing this, I just knew it was going to be a hit. You know, what, what you did with the Timlin race and everything else, it's just... That's great. You're pulling no away pressure. the stigma. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, I know, but you know, you got you really pulling away the stigma, and 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 getting it that so that people will go for preventative. Uh, um, it's preventative health care, you know. And then when 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 crisis hits, that that they they have some place to go to. So really, thank you for doing this. It's you're you're amazing. Really, thank you. Our hope, our hope. I mean, Don and Colleen are so busy, you know, putting out fires. Our hope is that through really good education that we can really decrease the stigma um, so that the crises won't be at, I mean the evidence shows that the crises will not come up as much with mental health literacy. So we're trying. Awesome. So thank you. Can I leave these somewhere? Or? Sure. Through the chair, quick question for Dawn. Who is hoping to an organization, organizing for prevention? Where do they meet? Are these public meetings? Yes. Ah, sure. <laughs> Um, it's a substance misuse prevention coalition that was started by Denise Hildreth when she came on board in 2015. Um, and it's, it involves various aspects of community life, being law enforcement, parents, youth, um, the religious community. Um, and there are 12 sectors total um, that come to the table and talk about substance use prevention and, and different methods to get at that. And so um, the, the meetings are, um, well, to find out about them, they could reach out to our office because they're, right now they're varied. We have a training program in place about building capacity. So now's a nice time if the public is curious to inquire. Um, I've had an inquiry this, this past week. It was really exciting of a, a former resident who is in recovery and who wanted to become active. So that's nice. great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, seeing that at 7 o'clock, we have a posted public hearing. Uh, Section 15, package store transfer of license. Rashmi Corporation doing business as County Farm, I'm sorry, Country Farm, 3 Cedar Street. The board will open a public hearing to consider the application of Rashmi Corporation, DBA, Country Farm for license transfer and change of location for a Section 15 package store. Uh, I'd like to request a motion to open the hearing. So moved. Second. Okay. 
Other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. It carries. Good. Uh, will the applicant uh, please explain their request? Sure. Uh, good evening. My name is Attorney John Moradian from Democus Law Offices. With me is uh, Hina Ben Patel, um, one of the owners of uh, Rashmi Corp, who currently operate Country uh, Country Farm over in Three Cedar Street. Uh, Rashmi is entered into purchase and sale agreement with um, uh, Foster Street Liquors LLC, who operates Old Town Liquors over on 70 Main Street. Um, they're requesting approval of uh, transfer of the license to Rashmi Corp, approval of the change of location for the license premises to Three Cedar Street, approval of Hina Ben Patel here as a manager of record, and approval of a pledge of the license and inventory to Rockland Trust Company as they are financing the deal. Um, essentially, they're moving the license from one location to their, their current store over on, on Cedar Street. Mm -hmm. Um, a little bit about Hina, she's experienced in retail alcohol sales, um, and she's owned um, country farms, I believe, for 20 years approximately. Um, so they're just trying to change the business a little bit, add the liquor license. The store will be more of a liquor store with a few grocery items. There is a Subway franchise there that will um, cease operation, you know, pending approval of the transfer of the license and, and closing. Um, uh, with that, I welcome any questions you, you may have regarding the application. Okay. Board members? <clears throat> so, if I could, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a little sore here. Um, the, uh, the subway goes away. The, the, the grocery store component, the candy store component, the kids component, what happens to all that stuff? So they're going to, it's going to become a liquor store, and they're going to sell grocery items in terms of chips, soda, uh, candy, anything you kind of go in there. If you go to buy liquor, you can buy a mixer. You can buy a bag of chips. Um, they're not going to be targeting uh, kids in the store um, for that kind of aspect. Okay. John? Oh, maybe you don't care, but what happens to the yield liquor store? Is that where it's moving from? Excuse me? Is it moving from the from the ye old liquor store? Yeah, it's yeah, Foster's. They're taking Foster's. It. So, so what's going to happen to the building? At so they are buying the building too. Um, they they will welcome in the commercial tenant on that first floor, wherever it may be. Um, okay. And I, and I do want to clarify one thing on the application uh, regarding the hours. <coughs> um, the hours are going to coincide with what's, what's permissible to sell alcohol um, in the state. So Sundays, 10 a.m. to 9 p.m., uh, Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., and Friday and Saturday night. Saturdays will be 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. Mr. Kamala, do we currently have a provision that allows um, liquor stores to open at 8 a.m.? The revised hours comply with the town's okay. alcohol policy. Right. So I'm a little confused. We're going to take Old Town Liquors. We're going to move it to Country Farms. Country Farms becomes what other name it becomes. The subway and everything goes away. It's just a liquor store primarily, correct? And then the building that Old Farm Liquors or Old Town Liquors is in now is also being sold to you folks as part of the transaction. And then that building is going to be developed as a commercial space. Is that correct? Right. Well, there's, there's residents, up, I believe, on the second and third floor, and the first floor where the current liquor store is, is will be vacant until they can find a, a, a new tenant to go in there. So that's a beautiful old building that's been in the center of town for a long time. And I would hate to see this transaction create a long-term vacancy in that building, and perhaps that building become in disrepair and the lot become in disrepair, etc. The town recently voted to spend a lot of money with state and federal funding as well as some of our own to beautify the entire downtown corridor. We don't want to see that building become a big eyesore in the middle of that beautiful downtown corridor. So as long as there's a plan to maintain and develop and aggressively fill that building, I'm good. But I don't want it to, to not go that way. Right, well, they'll seek a, uh, a commercial tenant, and, and they don't plan to leave it vacant because it doesn't, you know, financially work that way. They need to have someone in there to, to maintain the building and to keep it going. 
I assume that there's a note on that building as well, and the bank's right. going to want to make sure there's a tenant there too. So right. everybody wants that filled. I mean, everybody wants to fill. Sure, mm -hmm. everybody's clear. We want that filled. I will, I will not sit vacant, you know, for years and or the. One more quick one. Go ahead. So, and this is the this is the layout that you're planning on having for yes. the for the liquor store, and there's sufficient room for people to for ADA compliant and everything for mm -hmm. to take that through. Okay. Mr. Kamal, this is a full liquor store, correct? This is everything, not just beer and wine. This is yeah. a full yeah. liquor store. Mm -hmm. Mr. Nasrullah, do you have anything? Yeah, um, I, Mr. Kamal, I didn't think that we had liquor stores opening on Sunday at 10 a.m. Uh, is mm -hmm. I suppose. we do? We do. We do. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, that was my only question: Was <laughs> are we allowed to go sell liquor that early in, in Massachusetts? There you go. No, I just <laughs> I just have a comment. Um, I will very much miss a country farms in this town since Colola's went out. A lot of people have kind of been depending on that for bread and milk and and all of those uh, <coughs> accessories for their daily <laughs> homes and whatnot. Uh, and I, you know, from Cedar Street West, we have five liquor businesses. From Cedar Street East, we have none. And it just seems like the town is, it's all one-sided on one side of town. And I, I, I don't know really that we, that we need another liquor store in the downtown area. Uh, okay. So I'm not sure we do. Just not to be a contrarian, but yeah. We're not gaining, <coughs> they're not adding a liquor store, they're just moving a liquor store. Right. So, uh, if anything, they're losing a suburb. A, a much bigger location, yeah. Um, <coughs> so, Mr. Kamal, the application that falls into the four corners of everything that we need uh, through, our, <coughs> through the requirements of our town? Yeah, through the chair, uh, we did circulate the application to uh, both town uh, permitting offices as well as town council. Um, to date, we have not received any adverse comments. Okay. So really, regardless of what our thoughts are, our hands are kind of tied. <coughs> it's, it is what it is. So, um, so this is a public hearing. I will now open it up to public comment. Is there anyone from the public that would like to say anything? You can say something, Marty, sure. From here. Oh, from here. Oh, can I do it from here? No. Fine. Thanks for asking. Margie Wigan, well, 8 Apple Tree Hill Road. I just want to say that um, these nice people have been speaking to me for years about the eventuality of having a liquor store. So I think it's great, especially <coughs> because we're not gaining a liquor store, we're just moving a liquor store. Um, that location seems to be off the beaten path in a better parking situation maybe. I know sometimes people park in the post office lot. But um, I think it's a good idea and I really think they deserve a chance to have this work for them. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hearing no other public comment, I will request a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstain? All right, so Mr. Catino, I will uh, entertain a motion. You? Sure. I'd like to make a motion to approve the transfer of license and change the location of Section 15, all alcohol package store for Rashimi Corporation, doing business as uh, Country Farm, at 3 Cedar Street, with the hours of operation Sunday, 10 a.m. to 9 p.m., Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., and Friday and Saturday, 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. Second. Okay, any further discussion from the board? Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. The current owner of Old Town Liquors, whatever it's called these days. Yeah. You Foster are comfortable with this transaction that's been described? You we'll say something? Are you, are you comfortable with the transaction? Yeah. Yes, I am. And it's going to be good for the town, I guess, because it's going to open to one other than space for the community. And plus, it's a nice family man, knows in town for 20 years. And you have other two liquor stores, it's going to bring the prices much better than I, because it's going to buy in bulk. And I think it's 
Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You have two other liquor stores? Yeah. None in Hopkins, right? No. Nope. No. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstain? Carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Oh. The other motions? Is there another motion? Oh, the motion for the uh, Hina as manager of record. Yeah, yeah, for the pledge. Oh. Yeah, for the pledge as well as the manager. No, I don't have another motion here. Yes, on the application. On the application. Um, to the chair, Mr. Kamala, could you just enlighten us on that one then? Yes. Um, the board, the chair may accept a motion to approve uh, the change of manager to Hina Ben Patel and yeah. the pledge of the license and inventory to Rockland Trust Company, excuse me, as they're financing the, the yes. transaction. Yes, I rather have that as two separate motions. The first one being uh, to approve the manager. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I move, I move that uh, we approve the change of manager. Second. Yeah. As stated. As stated. Yeah. As stated. As yeah. written. Yeah. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, abstain, it carries. And the second motion? To approve the, the pledge of license. License and, inv license and inventory to Rockland Trust Company. Okay, so moved. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, abstain, it carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kamala. Uh, KEA Technologies, is there a, is KEA Technologies here? Okay. The select board will hear from representatives from KEA Technologies relative to proposal to locate a cannabis testing laboratory at 86 South Street, which requires a host community, community agreement with the town. Um, good evening, Jim. Good evening. Good evening. My colleagues. So my, my name is Bud Zauk. Um, I'm the founder and uh, president and CEO of KEA Technologies. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background for KEA is and what we're trying to do. Uh, KEA, I sta started KEA back in 2015. We're a small business with about 31 employees in uh, Marlboro, Massachusetts. Um, one of the primary projects we've been working on for the past 10 years, even before I started, was developing in-vehicle alcohol detection. Um, this is a program funded by all 17 automakers and the federal government. Uh, and it's the purpose of it to have in your vehicles as you're in the next probably four to five years, a, uh, an alcohol sensor that can detect whether someone is above the legal limit or below the legal limit, and then whether they allow them to drive or not. Um, and obviously, uh, and, and that's one of the areas that we've been working on, including rail safety and technology. Um, and part of what we have also at KEA is an ISO accredited uh, alcohol testing lab where we test the breath alcohol uh, devices, uh, things like uh, baits that are used for enforcement or breathalyzers. Um, obviously, uh, we all know that cannabis is legal in Massachusetts and is legal in multiple states, up to 32 states today, um, from medical to recreational. So the next big holy grail is developing in-vehicle cannabis detection. Um, and to that end, what we wanted to do at KA, we established a separate company because we do federal uh, work. We can't have any cannabis tie-in. That's A to Z. Um, and uh, the purpose of A to Z is to do uh, cannabis testing and to do cannabis research and development. And the concept is that over the, over the time, as we're collecting that data, it feeds the development at KEA for cannabis detection, uh, in-vehicle cannabis detection. Um, so that kind of is an overview of what we're trying to do um, at, uh, at A to Z, essentially. And we're looking, we're seeking um, uh, to have a, to enter into a co host community agreement, uh, an opportunity to enter into a host community agreement with uh, Hopkinton. Um, maybe a little bit of clarification on when we talk about cannabis testing. Um, we're, we're not talking about holding any um, significant quantity of cannabis. This is very, very small, minute uh, amount of cannabis. Um, when the cannabis sample comes in, the state requires um, that um, every grower tests every 10 pounds of cannabis. Uh, for uh, multiple things, things like uh, heavy metals, pesticides, um, terpenes, different chemicals uh, that can be present in the, in the plant itself, uh, but as well as the edibles that they sell. And then before a, a dispensary can sell that product, 
um, they have to have the sticker or the labor label on the product that says it's passed these requirements. Um, so essentially what, we, what, the, what the testing lab does is uh, picks up the sample or a sample gets delivered securely uh, by a, a discrete uh, small van uh, that has cameras inside uh, with 24-7 monitoring as well as two drivers. Um, the samples are immediately extracted. The, the, what's, uh, what's inside the sample is extracted and the sample itself is disposed of. And then it goes through multiple chemistry machines from uh, high performance liquid chromatographers to, to uh, uh, UV uh, analysis and all types of different analysis. Um, and then once, um, it, you know, it's essentially a barrel that you fill, a small barrel that you fill with a disposed sample, that's uh, uh, disposed of according to the CCC, the Control Cannabis Commission requirements. So there are uh, regulations when it comes to security, transportation, and, and uh, maintaining what's inside the facility as well. And at no point does one person that touches the sample when it comes in will touch it on, on, uh, as it's being disposed. Everything is scanned and tracked from the moment the sample comes in to the moment it's disposed of. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, um, what we're seeking. Mr. Kamala, do <laughs> you have anything to add? At this point, no. <clears throat> Thank you. We're fine. I have a question. Um, so how much um, product would be on site at any one particular time? Um, less than what you would, what's allowed to carry. Okay. So if there's a grower who's growing 100 different strains. Yes. And he sends 100 different samples. Correct. How much would be on site? Uh, so it also depends on what we can uh, take in, right? So 100 different samples will probably be, would not be able to respond at, at, a, at that pace. So um, it's... You know, typically it's a sample every, uh, out of every 10 pounds of the product, and it's a small sample. It's a very minute sample that gets extracted and disposed of immediately. So as soon as the sample comes in from the vehicle, it gets extracted and disposed, and then the extraction starts going into the various machines. So it's very small quantities that we hold at, at, a, at a time inside the facility. So you would never have more than, say, an ounce or a pound or, uh, I mean, it would always pound be is way high. Okay. In ounces. Okay. Um, and... Uh, could you describe your security measures? Uh, yes, absolutely. So 24-7 uh, uh, surveillance cameras, key card access restrictions, um, backup alarms, backup, uh, everything is battery backed up. Um, we have failure notification for, uh, for the system itself. Um, we'll have uh, perimeter alarms uh, and uh, uh, perimeter surveillance videos as well as interior surveillance videos. Um, and and uh, uh, bad security access. Mm -hmm. And even within the bad security access, there are certain areas that only certain people are allowed in, so their badge will only work on those certain locations and not other locations. Okay. And you'd be testing uh, both oils and flour? Yes. Okay. Any, any product that contains THC, basically. And then that's a requirement of uh, the CCC. But it wouldn't be like an actual, say, an edible that you're testing? It would be the the raw materials, or you would be testing the actual? Uh, we would be testing the actual edible. Okay. We'll be extracting out of the edible samples and then disposing of it. Okay. Thank you. Mary Jo? Well, <laughs> I'm going to be a little naive here because I don't really understand. You're going to get very small quantities. Yes. And you're going to test those. Yes. And then what, what's the process? The person selling it gets an okay from you? Or yeah, so or? what we do is a certificate, is essentially a certificate that goes to the state and to the grower that this sample complies or doesn't comply with the state. So the state has requirements. So for example, pesticides, we have nine different pesticides that we have to test with. Frankly, if we test our food as much, it would be fantastic. Um, but we have nine different pesticides that we have to test, you have to test the, the product against. And only certain percentage of those different types of pesticides can be allowed. If it exceeds that, then the product is rejected. It cannot be sold. Um, if it's within those limitations, then the product can be sold. So a certificate goes to the, to the CCC, and then it goes in, in, at the same time to the grower, and they're allowed to sell it in a dispensary. So the grower is sending you this little teeny sample. Yes. And you're certifying that little teeny sample. Correct. Who... Who then is checking on the grower to make sure the rest of the marijuana 
so, so is the control, out of that sample. Yeah, the I mean, you know, they could send you a sample they know is fine and be growing something else. So uh, absolutely. So all that, all that process is pretty controlled by the Control Cannabis uh, Commission. Um, I'm, okay. I'm not, I can't speak on, on the behalf of, of the growers because that's not, we, you know, what we know is we used to get a sample out of 10 pounds of what they produce and the, the CCC says it has to be tested at an independent testing laboratory and that's the key. We have to be independent and we have to be ISO accredited, which is a pretty rigorous accreditation on the quality of our equipment, our processes, our machines and our testing. It's a chemistry lab primarily dedicated to testing the, uh, a product. I, I can shed some light on that too. Yes. So the, the driver and the transportation company will go in and the grower will give them the option of where to pick from in that sample. Yeah. Uh, fast grown. It's, it's totally random. Okay. Mr. Casino. Yeah, I really appreciate your presentation. Yeah, looking through it, you know, looking at, at each of the uh, gas chromatography machines, just spectroscopy machines, and you know, you you go through all your all your security and, and everything. It, it's just very well done. You a great presentation. You know, this is exactly the kind of businesses that we're trying to attract here in Hopkinton. So you know, and, and to steal somebody from Albro, that's a Mr. Kamala. Good job. This is exactly what we've been trying to do. So really, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for such a great presentation. It's uh, uh, it just very well done. Thank you. Um, so, you, Hopkinton had a ballot initiative or a question, a uh, town meeting, I don't remember exactly how we made the decision, but we had a decision in town about retail sales and growing in the community, and it failed overwhelmingly. Mm -hmm. So the mindset of Hopkinton is we're not doing the pot thing, right? Yeah. But to Mr. Catino's point, your business model, from what I understand, is making what is legal in Massachusetts safer. Absolutely. And I think that's a great thing. Uh, you know, so um, I, I'm, I'm glad that we can, and I think our bylaws support this type of business coming to our community even after we voted down retail sales growing, etc. cetera. Um, so we'll make sure of that. I'm sure Mr. Kamala already has, but we're good there. Uh, I think it's anything that makes us, it's safer for people to consume is, is the right way to go. And I'm glad Hopkins can, can help facilitate that. Is the, the facility itself, is it going to be like a clean room facility? Uh, it's a testing lab. I wouldn't call it a clean room, but it's a testing lab facility. So it's not, so that, that was one of the most challenging aspects for us is if you look at all the town's zoning, um, industrial zoning, typically for growers, for cannabis, it's not any place where you can put a testing facility. And it was very difficult to find a town and a location that would offer the testing facility that can meet our requirements. Mm -hmm. um, we're not talking about a warehouse here. We're talking about, a, right. as you can see from the presentation, all the equipment. It's a significant investment in equipment that is very sophisticated and requires uh, constant maintenance, constant uh, 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 calibration. So, um, yes, the facility is not a clean room, but it's a lab. It's a, it's a let's almost like a biomedical lab. Yeah, I think that just helps the residents that may be watching understand what's going to go on here. It's not a bunch of folks hanging out. No, no, no. Back no, step, no. sort of testing it to see what it's like, right? That's yeah. not there what There is no here. sale. There is no people that are going to be coming in and out. There is nothing other than just, you know, it's a testing lab. Okay. I think it's a great idea, and I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Yep, agreed. All right, Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Through the chair. Um, you provided a facility layout plan. Yes. You've also explained the security around your facility. Who are your neighbors? Um, that's a great question. I'm so trying to so remember uh, our neighbors. There was a fire, um, so fire, fire alarm, suppress, testing, fire alarm so testing company that was next to us. But, but right, right next to us, there's a, a flying car company. I can't remember the yes, name. Yes, I can't remember the name. Um, um, and they were scaling down. So they're now in the current facility, and they're scaling out of it. And that's a facility we'll be op occupying. Mm -hmm. And the, who's using the, the remainder of the building? We, each only each location has their own door in that facility. So that, that area the right there that you see has its own door. So we'll have our own door. And then this, the neighbors have their own uh, door. It, it, it's uh, separated. Separated. So there's no sharing of entrances. 
Okay. I'm, I'm sure if the town's decision is to move the discussion forward, that uh, you'll be discussing these plans with the... Uh, absolutely, yes. ...the police department. Okay. But do we need a motion or anything like that, Mr. Kamala, or...? Is there a motion for this? I don't think so. Yeah. This was just an informational thing, wasn't it? It um, may be helpful for the board at least to move a motion to authorize the town manager to uh, begin the process for uh, investigating a host community agreement with uh, T A or Z. A, A to Z. A T or Z. Yeah. yeah. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstain? It carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 1854 Cycling Company. A select board will hear from representatives from the 1854 Cycling Company relative to the company's plan to undertake manufacturing operations at 80 South Street and intent to apply for the Massachusetts Economic Development Program and a tax increment financing TIF agreement in Hopkinton. Yes. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, I just want to introduce ourselves as in the company to uh, to the select board just briefly. We started the company in, in 2016 and uh, it has grown significantly since then. Um, we started the company simply as a place that provides employment for formerly incarcerated people. Uh, my background is, no, is not in bicycles, it is not in cycling or in motorcycles, it is in nonprofit work. So the reason why I started the company was to create this job based on an algorithm that stated that 51% of the people in Framingham at the time who were living beneath the poverty threshold were formerly incarcerated. And a lot of them were, and a majority of them were women who had children in their, in their school system. So we've grown since then from a company that just simply made single speed bikes to making electric bikes. In 2018, we were one of the companies awarded uh, participation into the Mass Challenge Business Accelerator that's partnered us with a number of larger corporations and through that, we, were, we, we developed a uh, product that has now been very significant. It is a uh, tactical bike, bicycle that's used for police officers. Mm -hmm. The issue that we found was that in the, pro in the processing and making of the prototype, there was no facility that in, within the state that had the ability to mass produce carbon fiber, as particularly at this size and at the scale in which we need to meet the demand that we found. So we had to look for a facility that gave us the space to do so and to secure the number of jobs we need to produce demand that we had for this facility, and we found 80 South Street. So um, we uh, – not this up. <laughs> framing him. <laughs> yes, not that it's up. Um, to give you an idea, we call ourselves the 1854 Cycling Company because in 1854, in Framingham was the site of the first anti-slavery rally. And this is where um, a lot of our greatest abolitionists stood, stood in um, with, with each other shoulder to shoulder and said that people who had been freed since 1826 should not be taken back into enslavement due to the Fugitive Slave Act. And to commemorate uh, that in the same way that we don't want a lot of our employees to go back into incarceration, we, we named that in honor of the 1854 Cycling Company. And since then, we've sold bikes around the world. We've done a lot of great things. This is um, a picture of me when I was a keynote speaker at uh, the Bethany Hill organization just last year. We've been featured in Bloomberg Magazine, and uh, we've done WCBV Chronicle. Just most recently, we were in the Boston Globe. That's right. Yeah, and so, and um, this has not been announced yet, but in 2020, we'll be awarded this, one of the small businesses of the year by the Worcester Business Journal. And our growth has been rapid. And this is where we are now with this particular bicycle. And um, it will be no bicycle like this in the world that we can produce. And def this is why the space that we needed can only be found at a place like 80 South Street. And so when we found this location, we've been um, diligently looking at how to get the right equipment in this, in this building and also to make sure it's sustainable for our employees and the environment and it, everything seems to work out so far. So I open the floor to any questions you may have about the company and our plans. Mr. Kamal, before we open to the board, do you have anything, or should we go to the board first? I'll defer to the board at this point. Okay. Uh, Mary Jo? 
<laughs> I don't know where to start or, or what to ask you. Um, looking at, at the bikes and the program, I certainly commend your uh, using X cons, I don't know <laughs> another word for it, uh, and giving them hope and, and, a, and a job for the future. And that is something to be very proud of. Uh, looking at some of these bikes here, they're just incredibly engineered, and they, they look fabulous. Um, I wouldn't have any problem with this. Mr. Uh, Nashula. So everything you said showing us looks incredible. Um, I ride a bike a lot. And well. I'm under a lot of NDA, so I can't talk a lot about a lot of other things. But I beg your pardon? There's a lot of non-disclosures that we had to file, so oh, okay. there's some things we can... <laughs> so the bikes look incredible. Um, I, I, the business plan sounds incredible. Um, I welcome you to the town. Um, what other kinds of bike? What, you know, what other kinds of bikes would you be producing? Is it just one? Well, our, our um, goal in the next five years is to actually complete directly with Harley Davidson. Okay. We would love to produce motorcycles and motorcycle chassis using some of the same technology of communications between um, bicycle officer and its vehicle. And we have the engineers and the other backing from other, from people, other companies, other companies <laughs> involved that we believe this is going to be very possible within the next few years. However, our growth is predicated on having a building such as the one at 80 South Street. Mm -hmm. Great. Good. Uh, I, I just love seeing seeing your, your proposed uh, build out. You know, uh, 80 South Street's been empty for a while. We had it as a temporary town hall for a while, and yes. it worked out great for us. But to see it, you know, come back alive again, it was uh, what a, a, a uh, caterpillar manufacturing area for a while, repair area, and uh, just just to see it, uh, you know, completely build out, it looks just great. I'm uh, just really thank you so much for uh, for coming onto South Street and making a uh, making that building come alive and bringing some more life to uh, to South Street other than, than EMC Dell and uh, we just hope to see you uh, grow and prosper thank you thank so, much. so much thank you it's a for-profit venture yes it is okay and uh, the request is for a TIF yes okay and you're going to file with the Mass Economic Development Commission as well, right? Yes. Um, how about employees? What will be the, what's the employee number? What, what does that look like? Well, right now we're looking at, uh, for the first year, 42, but only 16 of those being formally incarcerated as we will need to get started with the robotics and the engineering and that side to actually facilitate how we will train the employees that come in to actually do the manufacturing and working with the robots because there's a six month process that's gonna, uh, with IL, ISO certification right. and other things like that before we can bring in and make sure all of our employees are um, ready for the programming challenges, a lot of the, working with robotics and the advanced manufacturing capabilities that we will have at that facility. What do you see as the high end number for employees in the future? A high end number would be 146. 146, that's budget and planned out. Yes, that's pretty. I mean, that's a great number of employees coming to the area, and uh, I think it's an excellent idea, and, and we've done tips in the past. Some have worked, some have not. Uh, we make sure that the tips now that we put forward have clauses in them that if it doesn't work for whatever reason, that, that the, 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 the company the grants that we gave or the, the lack of billing or whatever, I don't, I'm not, I'm sick of that. I just want to have something down here. I can't even think. What, you know what I'm saying? What the clawback, if you will, yes. uh, is have, we need to have that in place. Yes. Uh, because the town has done this in the past and we've lost a significant amount of money. Understood. So we've learned. So please understand that that will need to be in there. Mr. Kamala, I'm yes. sure we'll work on that. Um, but I think uh, in general, TIFs if done the right way can benefit both parties. Yes. And we want to support businesses coming to town and we want to support you with some kind of TIF, but we have to have it be a sort of partnership. Yeah, understood. And uh, one of the only things that would prevent us from uh, bringing in 42 within the, the next calendar year would be the um, ISO certification. Sure. That would be the thing that we'd have to bring in because there's a certain certification with a, what this advanced carbon fiber manufacturing that we're doing. It's not the same as the layup process and the goop. It's an actual robotics machine that does this, and that's a whole 
new new territory we're crossing. Sounds great. So I guess I will be kind of the wet blanket on this. Um, <laughs> my goal would be, as a selectman in this town, is to fill South Street with businesses that that uh, that turn our economy more vibrant than it already is. Uh, your business plan sounds pretty good. Concern that I have for the town. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you don't core your employees. Excuse me. You don't yes. core. You core your employees. Uh, yes. yes. In fact, uh, we have a meeting uh, on the twentieth with the Worcester County Sheriff's Department. Yeah. We're partnering with them. Yeah. We're, par we're partnering together yeah. to actually train specific uh, yeah. nonviolent employees. Yeah. Because one of the problems that we would have if we did not core our employees is mixing employees who maybe have suffered some trauma while incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to bring in um, employees who may be dangerous to other employees within the organization. So it's kind of a mandatory thing because we don't want to create a company culture that's so much like what they've been through, through mm -hmm. during incarceration that it prevents them from being vibrant citizens and residents outside of there. So part of that core information will come during their um, their screening for instance for employment so so for your quarries for your employees mm -hmm. where do you draw the line for um, next cons we draw the line at violence first and foremost so there are certain um, there are certain how can I say it uh, transgressions that may have occurred that we cannot have and a lot of this infl in inflicting violence upon others uh, particularly women and children mm -hmm. because a lot of those things will bring back other mm -hmm. things and, and expose us in terms of things uh, that may put us in jeopardy for other kinds of things that would jeopardize the business as a whole because part of this is that we want to be a success story to show other companies that this is a labor pool from which they can draw on and so if we're not successful then this stigma that's over ex-offenders ex will remain mm -hmm. so we have to draw the line at the at the employees who are most likely to be benefited, which is, will require a little, a few interviews with their parole officers and others, but will require a background check that we can ensure their mental stability as well, because we are worried about the mental health of anyone that we may be, may employ. In fact, it is one of our biggest concerns. So, when you say that a violent crime or conviction yes. of a violent crime would preclude them for working for you. Yes. Selling drugs is not a violent crime. Yes. Um, but it does a lot of damage. Yes. Um, obviously, you, you kind of hit a nerve with me. Yeah. I, I work in the prisons. Exactly. Um, that riot that happened the other day, those, those three people that got beat up were three of my... Shirley? Yep. No. Three of my very close friends. Mm -hmm. um, we've had issues where we had a carnival here and the uh, the employee I knew from the prison was a, a, a convicted sex offender. Yes. But he passed a quarry. Mm. I don't want to mm. sacrifice our tax base. I don't, don't want to increase our tax base for the company that's going to bring in um, people that we generally wouldn't want to be brought into town. And um, just to your point, sex offense, pedophilia, any, any incident of assault and battery, we can't have that. What because about drugs? excuse me, drugs are okay. Well, um, um, the the problem with drugs, and particularly with dealing with women, is that a lot of convictions are based on things their significant others have done. You know, an affiliation with a boyfriend who may be involved, or some other significant other, or within proximity, they may not have had any kind of direction to this. But this is where we have to be real diligent about in, individually how we do this. So we can't make a blanket statement to say no when it may be someone who was at a college dormitory and this is her boyfriend and who got in trouble and they both got in trouble and she has a, a record because she was involved with him at the time or they were in the same car. Well, party. yeah, but that person then is, was convicted by a jury of their peers. Yes. Um, so what I see is like an, an acceptable, and, and it's not my job to de yeah. determine mm -hmm. uh, at what level criminal you allow work for you. Yes. But a DUI, three DUIs, that's yes. going to get you a prison sentence. Yes. I don't feel that that should preclude you from gaining employment with the, with the public. And I wouldn't have a problem having somebody exactly. come in that, that's had a couple of DUIs. Yeah. Uh, someone that's selling fentanyl to oh, yes. kids in school, it's not a violent offense. But it's not tolerable amongst other people who may have had that addiction. 
just for instance, we'll be dealing with people who may have had opioid addiction. Yeah. And those kind of situations and coming out of that kind of crisis. And someone who's going through that or maybe have had issues with other alcohol or other drugs and things mm -hmm. like that, we can't have them around someone who may have that kind of problem on their criminal record. This is where the company culture takes precedent. Yeah. Who are we going to bring in involved in this as opposed to the other people who we're bring, who we're bringing in? Because these two people cannot mix. Yeah. We can't have that mixture. So me saying this person can't be here um, based on this is kind of a difficult thing based on the company chemistry, so to speak. Yeah. And we have to be very delicate about how we put this initial 42 together. Yeah. Because that foundational employment sets the stage for everyone else. Yeah. So, and it's difficult and early at, that, at this stage to say that, but with that in mind, certain individuals we cannot have because those individuals may disrupt right. others, so to speak. Mr. Kamalo, am I a little bit too into the weeds here? Or is it, are these appropriate questions for me to ask? I, I think the, they're, oh, sorry. I think they're appropriate. Uh, yeah. Um, the focus of the discussion is gaining a better understanding of how this facility will operate. And I, I further to the Chair's questions, I understood when we first met that you, you were going to focus on female or women uh, yes. Ex yes. Yes. It will be mostly, if not m mostly, women who we are looking to employ. Ex women who are ex-offenders, yeah. particularly because a lot of these women have a, they're more susceptible to poverty, yeah. and they're also very susceptible to poverty amongst their children as well. So it's a generational poverty cycle that we're trying to break. I think they're fair questions, and I think it's a good dialogue to have. Yeah, it is. But I also put my, myself in their seat as a for-profit entity trying to generate, you know, income for their stakeholders, whoever that may be. Are you guys public? Are you going to go public? Or? No. Um, we, we, we're not public yet. So there's people that are, you know, going to have a vested interest in this in a lot of different ways, and obviously a safe working environment is going to be one of the big pieces of this puzzle. Add to that the Mass Economic Development Co Committee or Council and their input on something like this and their desire to drive these types of entities with these types of uh, models, operating models. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of safeguards that are going to be there, not only from the town's perspective and their perspective, but the Commonwealth's going to be looking on into this as well. Yeah. So my concern is solely for, I mean, I'm a parent. I have two young kids and I will parent my kids. Mm -hmm. I don't need other people to tell me where my kids can and can't hang out. Yes. Like, I know who's right and who's wrong to be around my family. Yes. Um, but if we can eliminate... So, so the fact that you market your company to cons, <coughs> yes. um, that kind of raises a red flag to me. Um, and then, so when you core them, only certain People, only certain crimes will be tolerated. Um, I mean, it, when you get into the, <clears throat> the whole con thing and you're, you're marketing towards that select audience, mm -hmm. a massive part of our job working in the prisons is not just having these people that have been found guilty that are serving their sentence mm -hmm. in our four walls. We have gang affiliations. Yes. We have... We have, for instance, the, the Crips and the Gangster Disciples can coexist, and the Bloods and the Latin Kings can coexist. But if either one of them see either, either one of them, you know, the, mm -hmm. the cross-contamination, it's, yes. I mean, you just saw on TV there were 15 people that went after three COs. Um, I don't want that to be 15 employees go after three cops. Yeah, and, 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 and I know that you. Yeah. I mean, it's easy for, for me to. For, it's easy for you to say that it's not going to happen. It's easy for me to say that it is. Yeah. You know a heck of a lot more about your industry than I do, and Mr. Hur's points are certainly well taken. Yes, uh, but for the safety of the town, it just certainly raises a red flag for me I, that I you're marketing to, towards the cons. Yeah, I would love to um, break out more of the employee structure of the company where we are having a lot of safeguards mm -hmm. in place for that. Not only like company security. But in terms of our internal threshold for uh, managing, you know, the mental health aspects of someone who may be, you know, in that. But we are really going to have to be stringent about who we hire. 
because at, uh, to, to, to uh, Mr. Brian's point, Mr. Harris' point, uh, there's a lot of eyeballs on this, mm -hmm. and if we fail, it could not only be catastrophic for the country, but for, not for for our company, but for our um, a lot of our stakeholders who want to see this succeed. Because whereas we do have a lot of bad bad characters out there, we have a lot of well-meaning people as well who just want an opportunity to do something beyond the seven or five dollars they can earn over at Target. Mm -hmm. You know, so we want to make sure that those people can find a different life or trajectory out of life, and to get to those people is the core of why we exist. Mm -hmm. Because in the years that we've been doing this work, particularly, well, the years that I've been doing this work, I've found that for every 10, there's going to be three bad apples. But I can't let those bad apples spoil the bunch for the other seven who are diligently work, working for a better life for their children. Because in the same way we love our children, they love theirs as well. Mm -hmm. And I have not found a more dedicated worker than the type that we're going to, that we're going to bring in. All right, well, I think you and I will agree to disagree. No uh, worries. And that's as far as I'll go. I'm mean, not going to track no very much anymore. But. Anything on the business? Or? Um, so are we, Mr. Kamala, what do we need? Do you, do you have anything to add to this? Or? Yeah, I, I think going forward, it may be helpful for us to have a clearer understanding of your partnership with the Sheriff's Office. Yes. Uh, especially with regard to answering some of the questions that have come up. Yes. Um, what I'm looking for from the board is if the board is so inclined respectfully um, to move a motion that will authorize the town manager and town council uh, to begin discussions with uh, um, 1854 Cycling Company uh, in relation to uh, their application for a Massachusetts Economic Development Program uh, as well as tax increment financing agreement in Hopkinton. I'll make that motion. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, <coughs> any Chair, yes. Mr. Kamala, you mentioned town council. It's an excellent point. Has there been any discussion with town council to date about the opportunity? Preliminarily, yes. And was there any concern on the town council's part of any kind? Uh, we have not received concerns yet. Uh, again, the, the conversations are very preliminary. Uh, we are yet to discuss the contents of the TIF. We have not seen the basis for, for the request. In fact, this afternoon I received a call from uh, Kevin Kuros, uh, who is the Mass Economic Development Officer for, um, for, for Central Mass. He's also interested in seeing how the town responds to your application. So the TIF, a lot of the TIF language is built around number of employees and things of that nature. So employee um, hiring practices and so forth, that could all be part of what a TIF could spell out, correct? Correct. So I think based on what I'm sensing we're going to do here with this motion, uh, the chair's concerns could be articulated in writing in that TIF. Yes. If there's a certain Corey re re um, requirements we want in there, I would love to have your input on that to make sure we develop a culture that you and I can both agree with needs to be there. Okay. But I Tell think me. it's important that, that, that Mr. Mayer is, is in yeah, the yeah. Yeah. process. I'd love to be part of it, but I don't think that that has anything to do with our job. Like, I don't think that I'm the one that's supposed to be in there <laughs> getting my hands dirty on this. I think we're to oversee <laughs> policy and procedure, and I'm glad to do it. Um, well, but that we could we could put that into this motion. I guess that's kind of where I'm going. Okay. This is, you know, I'm I'm in favor of of trying to move this forward, and the tip as we talked about earlier can work. But the concerns that he is an experienced individual in this world um, raises are legitimate concerns for the residents of Hoppe to consider. But we can consider them and then build them into that tiff if the if the town council understands this is where we're coming from. And the applicant is saying they're more than willing to do that too. So <laughs> that motion that who made the motion, Mr. Catino made, um, should include some language specific to uh, ensuring town council is aware of and uh, uh, able to work in the concerns raised by the board on February 4th, 2020. Is that a friendly amendment? Is that good with you? So work that out. However you work that in, Mr. Yeah. Carl, right? Just make that intelligent. One of our prime reasons for choosing Hopkinton, other than the marathon stats here, is because I've got 26 years' experience working within the town 
at EMC Corporation. Mm -hmm. 80 South Street was one of the buildings that I had. Mm -hmm. uh, with EMC, our culture was to make everybody feel like family and to become part of the fabric of the community as much as possible, not just to be another company. To that end, one of our goals is to make sure that we work closely hand in hand with the community to make sure that we're not rubbing somebody the wrong way. Because we don't want, we don't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't want somebody coming in to our neighborhood, wherever we live, and causing a problem, right. just as you wouldn't. Yep. And we want to be above board and make everybody aware of what our intentions are as well. Okay. I, I do appreciate your comment. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Uh, one last thought. Yep. <clears throat> uh, given the kind of engineering nature of your yes. company, do you have any plans for internships through the high school? Yes, we do. Um, as, a, as a parent of a son who's really heavy into uh, competitive robotics, <laughs> And advanced robotics, and uh, as particularly in, in terms of industrial design, mm -hmm. um, we definitely want to bring in a lot of interns, whether it be from the high schools or for the local universities, who can study these things and put practical applications. Because one of the machines that we're trying to bring into 80 South Street is one of the few machines that can take these um, computer-generated designs and put them into real time, into, a, into an actual form because we can formulate almost anything on a computer, but however, there are very few machines that can bring that into a reality at a certain size. So having one of those few machines there and giving people an opportunity to see this machine in real life will be a lesson for us to learn in terms of how, but also generating our internal talent. Mm -hmm. Because we believe that once we develop this talent, other companies are gonna come in and poach mm -hmm. you know, our talent quite a bit, but we wanna have a steady pipeline of engineering and, and particularly design and industrial engineering talent through our company. You can be doing carbon fiber printing? Um, it's not really printing, so, oh, okay. so to speak. It's like, uh, to describe it in, in a more literal sense, the machine actually takes the fibers and threads them onto the mold. Oh, okay. So it's like any shape or form that it can do, it'll whittle it right on the mold. And, it, mm -hmm. and it's huge, pretty much. So. Um, so I hate to put anyone on the spot, but tonight in our audience, we happen to have our deputy chief, our lieutenant. We have a sergeant here from the police. Uh, could I ask um, deputy chief or, or lieutenant, um, you've been part of the conversation here. You've heard it all. Are there any red flags that, uh, that are raised do you, or is there anything you'd like to comment on? I hate to, I'm sorry to put you on the no, spot. No, <laughs> no worries. It's a job to be on the spot. Mr. Chair, it sounds like I walked in and we were addressing the, uh, con the issue of having convicts and, as employees and yep. like that would always raise concern. You know, yep. uh, it's not a population that is prevalent in our, in our community. Um, other than that, um, that would be our own challenge. So. Okay. Okay. Lieutenant, feel the same way? There happens to be a CEO at Prime Minister there. Uh, yes. Agreed. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry for calling you guys on the spot. <laughs> That's why we're here. <laughs> Great. Um, so we have a motion and a second. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. I, I just, you know, I just want to say I, I think there's been a lot of talk about protecting the community, and, and I think that's all very warranted, and we'll make sure that happens through the TIF. But I also think that Ockington is the kind of town and the people are the types of people that want to give others a second chance, want to give others a third chance in life. We all make mistakes in life, and I think our community recognizes that as a whole. And I think that our community would, uh, as long as it's safeguarded, welcome the opportunity to be part of a process that does give people a second chance. And um, I feel that way, and I think a lot of people would agree with that. And just like the safeguard, too, Chair, just like the safeguards we just talked about in the previous one, that they have the security and, 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 and all of that. And, and um, again, it's bringing marijuana testing, which is testing we're looking for, and then, and then having, having um, your company come in and, and take over a very large building and bring it back to life it's, it, with, with all the security in there also is wonderful. Thank you. Commendable.
So I am also in favor of giving people second chances. But we, I sit in a chair that I have to vet what second chance is given. I mean, yes. And who receives that second chance? You, you get three speeding tickets in a year, you lose your license, you get a second chance. Um, you know, you, you go spend 15 years at Sousa, uh, it's not for shoplifting. No. And then, and even if it's not a, a violent crime, it sounds to me that through existing data, like your, your safeguards right now, something could sneak through. Um, I worked at Framingham too for a couple of weeks and it was a horrible place to work. But, um, I, and, and I don't know, I'm, I'm not an HR person, but I don't know if you can say that you're going to market yourself strictly to female cons. Uh, I think that's no. discriminatory. No, 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 we're not. We're not. That's we said primarily. We said for primarily because um, with other kind of gender gender roles now that we have, we can't necessarily say just women or you know etc. Or I think no it's a men. great argument for Mr. Tedstone to continue on the board of selectmen for many terms to come. You, <laughs> you are <laughs> sick and hallucinating. <laughs> <laughs> I will not give you a second chance. Hey, TV holds mental lips. All right, so that's it. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not right. going uh, to. No, we'll carry, carry on. So uh, we have a motion that's seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. And abstain. Okay. So Thank it's you. a four to one vote. Four to one vote. Thank you. Great. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. All right. Growth Study Committee. <clears throat> Representatives of the Growth Study Committee will review a proposal to create a town economic development office. <laughs> good evening. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Amy Ritterbush, 54 Grove Street, and I am also the chair of the Growth Study Committee, and I have with me tonight... Uh, Brandy Young, uh, 3 Doyle Lane. And also... Uh, Tim Brennan, uh, Spring Street. Okay. So, um, as you know, the Growth Study Committee was formed in the summer... Oh, and Mr. Catino also serves as our select board liaison to the Growth Study Committee. Um, so, as you know, we started meeting in the summer and fall, and we've been doing a lot of research on the growth that we've been, been experiencing in the last 10 years. And we had two public workshops, and um, we got, and one of the ideas that keeps bubbling to the surface in our workshops, and we've got a lot of great positive feedback from the community, is that perhaps we should create an economic development office. And we have researched this, and a lot of other towns, neighboring towns and peer towns, already have such an office. And so we've been trying to think about this and um, getting, doing some more research on what such a position would be like. And we wanted to present you with our research and get your feedback. And also wanted to let you know that because the town meeting warrant closed yesterday, we did put a placeholder article in the town meeting warrant for a non-binding um, article to kind of gauge public support for such an economic development office. And we don't have a budget, so obviously it's just not a non-binding article. But if it, the pub, if it demonstrated public support, it might be something you'd want to move forward in a future year. And, you know, we hope you might even consider it for this year, but we know the budget is very tight. But so anyway, the, um, do, did you guys get our handout that we sent um, last night? Did we? No. It's in their packet. Okay. Great. So we went, worked on a little bit defining the problem we're trying to solve. And um, the intent is of an economic development office is to um, create a position of a chief, chief marketing officer for the town much like the role a Commerce Department plays in advancing economic interests at state and federal levels, a town economic development office can serve as a central point for marketing the town to the outside world, be a connector to the commercial real estate industry, and facilitate business interests at all levels dealing with site selection, permitting, other services, and also particularly important for the downtown corridor project. We know that the businesses are really going to be hurting during that construction period. This person could help serve as a liaison and communicator between town hall, the contractor, public safety, and all local business interests for the duration of the project. And unlike our Chamber of Commerce, which is necessarily self-interested, the Chamber of Commerce, are, they run their own businesses and have their own interests, and they're working as volunteers, a town economic de development office would be a town advocate working in the town's interests instead, kind of looking more at the big picture. All right. So let's see. Then we did a little worksheet here that I think you have. So the expected outcome would be um, reduce the vacancy rate throughout the enhanced throughout uh, through enhanced communication between the town and the commercial industry. 
uh, significantly increase downtown vitality, provide a new indirect liaison to the larger corporate citizens on South Street and Elmwood Park, uh, support and maintain our ratio of, right now we have 16% commercial industrial to about 84% residential, and we wouldn't want that um, ratio to decrease and we'd have um, less commercial. So we want to ma at least maintain that ratio. Um, and then we would want to create measurable growth in restaurant ho hospitality tax revenue. And based on looking at other towns, we kind of guesstimated that um, it would be about $70,000 salary a year, maybe $40,000 in benefits, and $5,000 for office expenses. So about $115,000 a year. And we looked at Ashland, Westwood, and Lexington to, to get those esti estimated numbers. We have a chart in the back about the five-year cost. And so over five years, we were guesstimating about $791,000. And we just noticed a typo tonight. It says we'll require, I think, $4 million in new commercial growth to break even. And as I was doing the math tonight, I think it's more like um, $6 million a year in new commercial growth to break even. But we will double check that and get back to you. Let's see. Uh, what was the other? Another thought we had last night was that um, if you didn't feel confident that this was a good fit for the town, you could, instead of hiring a permanent person, do like a three-year contract with someone. And then you could reevaluate it after the third year and decide if it was really had been worth it or not. Let's see. And the benefit to the town is um, increasing the commercial industrial tax revenue, um, no deterioration in the ratio, regional engagement and outreach, outreach to the community, enhanced employment opportunities, and increased amenities like retail, hospitality, lifestyle services that affect the quality of life and that um, our residents would enjoy as well as um, new employers looking to re relocate to the town. And, and then we listed some strategic objectives from the vision statement. In the vision statement from 2015, we say we would want to encourage new growth and redevelopment consistent with our values and desires to protect the unique features of the town while allowing expanded employment, housing, and revenue opportunities. Um, ensure that future growth provides an appropriate balance of distinct, or, yeah, distinct residential, commercial, institutional, and government buildings and public spaces reflecting the attractive and historic character of the town encourage public and private partnerships that revitalize and invigorate the downtown and creating a more vibrant walkable center with an exciting mix of stores offices services and restaurants and then there were similar goals in the 2017 uh, master town master plan too i'm not going to repeat them because i think they're pretty similar let's see um, and then just the final point as part of our research uh, we learned that Compared to neighboring towns and peer towns, Hopkinton's school age population is 23% of the general population, and that, is, that was the highest of all our neighboring towns and the peer towns we looked at. And our over 65 population is lower than our neighboring and peer towns. And our population of the ages 25 to 35 is also lower than the neighboring and peer towns. So we're wondering if we could be do, doing more to attract more younger residents without school children yet, and doing more to retain our residents once they turn 65. And Amenities like stores and restaurants could be, you, could be things that could help attract these and retain these age groups, and they would also be attractive to employers considering moving here. So we hope you'll consider this. We know you have a tight budget, um, and I know that there's a potential for an override, but if, you're gonna, if you do end up putting an override forward, this might be something to add to it that would be for future planning, and it might not pay for itself in the first year, but in the long run, it might improve our commercial residential ratio. So we welcome your feedback and anything. Yeah, and I just to want add. to kind of add add to her point. As, as you look at the mag, step back and look at a macro picture of how Hopkinton compares vis-a-vis -vis some other towns in Metro West. Um, there are there's 13 towns that we looked at. 10 have actually a, a dedicated uh, website uh, for business development. Uh, I think nine of those have a committee dedicated to business development, and five of those had a dedicated officer. So we think that there's an opportunity here to have somebody who is dedicated to focusing on bringing businesses, the type of businesses that we want to, into the community. Uh, you know, how that's funded, I think there's a couple different options on the table, but um, I think Hopkinton's probably not getting their fair share of the businesses that are coming out to Metro West. You look at those, those towns that have economic development officers, um, you know, the ones Marlboro, Westboro, they have seen a significant uptick in commercial businesses and i.e. commercial tax revenue as a result of having a, uh, an officer in place. And in many cases, it's just not one officer, it's a team. So we think, you know, by, by having a focus on that and having essentially a hunter going out there and hunting for those type of businesses that we're going to bring in, 
we think that over a period of you know, two to four years, five years, I think the analysis looks at, we think that that position is going to be able to pay for itself uh, and be able to kind of help grow, not just stabilize, but I think grow that commercial tax base for the town. Good. Okay. Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Kamala knows that for the past six years or so I've been uh, asking for something like this. Um, and, uh, and and we have made incremental uh, steps. Uh, we brought in the, the, the uh, grant writer to try and bring in some more some more shows. You know, what, back when when CVS was coming in, and uh, people would were sending us messages. You're on the board of selectmen. Why didn't you select better businesses? It's like, well, that's not what we do. And that's what I was trying to uh, you know, have Mr. Kamala see you know, where we can fit it in the budget. And each year. We have tight budgets, so we've been trying to uh, get in there. But uh, uh, you know, we can uh, continue to push. I, 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 I worked on I worked on editing the, the 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 one that you guys got at the road study back with the uh, 2020, which is now 2030, because we went by the year 2020, we were supposed to have 20 percent business, and that's what 2020 was stood for. Yeah. So it's now it, now let's look for a thirty percent in twenty thirty. We're not at twenty. Good. So the the growth study committee <clears throat> is working to figure out how we kind of manage the growth in town, right? And a lot of that is on the residential side because that's what's really put a lot of pressure on us. And we'll talk about it with our budget here in a little bit. Um, and so this this idea comes out of trying to figure out. I'm asking a question, I guess. It's trying to come out of figuring out how we slow the growth of residential by building the commercial is is that the thinking i think really more balance it that we just keep getting more residential growth more people apply to build homes and but um but if we if we lose a tenant on south street we could our commercial could go down and we want to at least maintain that if not improve the properties on south street so that they uh, bring in more tax revenue yeah so, we're from, so this is the revenue side of things okay the balance yeah. so a couple of thoughts specific to that and 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 i think you know 12 years ago or 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we were 12,000 people, and at the time we were a town administrator form of government, then we became a town manager form of government, and now we're 18,000 people headed to 22, right? So it's a different animal. I was in Gardner, Massachusetts last night. It's a city by charter, and they have 19 or 20,000 people, so they're not much bigger than us, and they're a city, and they have an economic development. And the city of Marlboro has an economic development officer. I've worked with that person. Marlboro has a team. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the idea for Hopkinton is one that we need, we need to seriously explore now. We've talked about the 2020 group and the 2030 group and the Chamber of Commerce and this group and that group. Everybody trying to go out and find it, but it's everybody like herding cats. You know, if we had somebody in town hall, I think it would be a lot more focused effort just by the nature of it. Um, I think uh, the, 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 there was a, one. So I'm, I'm behind the idea. I don't know if we can do it this year yet or not. Uh, we got to figure out this budget thing, but I, th I do think the time has come for Hopkinton. I don't think the one job description that I heard is the relitigation with businesses and town hall specific to the corridor project. I don't want that in the job description mm -hmm. at all. We are building the corridor project. We're going to work with the businesses. We've already told them that, and Mr. Kamalo and Ms. Lazarus and myself and others on the board will handle that. Okay, I don't want that person bogged down in relitigating what's been litigated five times now. Uh, and finally, I think another piece of the puzzle we need to sort out as we think it through is who would this where would this position report into, or who would this person or team? Let's I think it's going to start with a person. Who would they report to, and let's make sure we get that right as well. I don't know what the answer to that is. I don't know if it's the town manager's office or. Or from, who, but from our research, it's usually with the town manager's office or someone okay. in the town manager's office. And the last thing, do we know the ratios of the towns that do have, and towns now, not the cities, but towns that have some form of position like this, what their ratios are for commercial versus residential? I think we're on the high end of resi, and we've been there forever. But if somebody's at 60 and they're at 40, they're at 60 40, I don't know if we want to go there either because that means the town's going to change dramatically. In its mm -hmm. look and feel, I, I, I don't think. But don't we have one of those in the slide? We that, did. I, I thought it was in the slideshow. We did at the public forum. 
um, Brian, and we can kind of double check on that. I, I think we're, we're we definitely on up. the high side of that. I mean, 60-40, we're not going to get there. It's just right. not going to happen. Right. But I think to, to the point of maybe if we get to 20%, that would be, I think, a huge, huge win. And I don't think it's unattainable, right? But I think if you put a, a strategic three-year plan and kind of say, hey, hey where's the delta going to be? And what, do you, what does that person need to do? And I agree with you. Hunters have to hunt, right? This person's not going to be writing grants. He's not going to be real. He or she is not going to be relitigating whatever's going on. They're focused to go out there and find those businesses and bring those businesses yeah. into town full stop. Yeah. You're thinking about uh, companies like uh, in Cambridge that are, uh, you know, bio startups that are now growing out of their spaces when they're paying, they could pay half the, the square footage in Hopkins and they're paying <clears> in Cambridge, <throat> and their workforce has probably worked, moved out to along the 495 corridor. It's like a win-win, but this person has to get in go there find and really go get them. Mm -hmm. I do think it's, it's something that's it's time has come in Hopkinton. We just got to figure out how to do it. Thank you. I agree with everything I've heard. Um, one question of you. Has there been any, uh, have you looked at any kind of regional approach, or not a regional, but, you know, multi-town approach where, because I think of, I think of like, this 135 corridor, <laughs> Upton, Hopkinton, Ashland, we're all in the same boat. And, uh, except we're better. Except we're, yeah, <laughs> go Hopkinton. Uh, <laughs> we're the highest town in Middlesex <laughs> County, so there you go. Uh, but has, have we looked at any of that? I mean, is there any kind of... That's a great point. I don't think we've, we haven't looked at it necessarily to aggregate. I know we've reached out to the woman in Ashland, uh, mm -hmm. who's pretty enthusiastic about the job. Mm -hmm. But part of it is, um, and I didn't speak with her, but um, the sense was they don't want to tip their hand too much mm -hmm. because they're competing, right? They're, of they're trying to bring you know, businesses into Ashland vis-a-vis -vis Hopkinton. So I, I, you'd have to kind of, everybody have to play nice in the sandbox mm -hmm. in order for that to really work. And um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be selfish here, and I'm going to say I want the, those businesses coming into Hopkinton, mm -hmm. full stop. We could look into that if other towns yeah. do something shared. And I, that I works. think you'd have but to kind of look at it in terms of just not 135, but almost like a, a broader consortium. Mm -hmm. um, and then who wins? How, how do you split? If, if a big business comes into Hopkinton or gets into, into Marlboro and you're all in the consortium, does Marlboro get all the winning? Or is it split? Mm -hmm. Well, well no. I, mean, I guess my thought was like if we're looking at you know Ashland and, and Upton, um, we're going to win every time because of our location. We're right off 495, right? Um, but they may, you know, I you know some, 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 com some towns may, you know, some companies may want to be a little further away. From, you know, we should so. win, but if, if the woman from, a if we don't have a person, the woman from Ashland is beating down those companies saying, come to Ashland, come to Ashland, come to Ashland, then we're already behind the eight ball because we have no one, no one pushing Hopkinton on, on mm -hmm. that company or service or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Use our space. Mary Jones. Well, I was on the Economic Development Task Force in Franklin uh, as a state representative years ago, and I, I have this little problem with Hoppington. We want to stay countryfied, etc., and look at what we've already done on the corner you know, with the spoon and, and added everything up there and there's no parking and, it, and it's very difficult and across the street, the banks and unless we have the room to spread out economic development, it, it's, I mean, we can bring in some new businesses, some new business faces to the downtown and we can modify South Street or, or bring some new businesses into South Street but we have to have some place to put more economic development if that's what you want to do. And uh, when I was looking at the, the money that we're going to have to have for this person for an excellent number of years to make that money back, plus we're going to have to make more if it's going to be economic development. We're talking millions of dollars. And, you know, within five years, six years, they have to be able to bring in millions of dollars to this town within six years. I mm -hmm. am very skeptical mm -hmm. uh, that that can happen with, with one person doing economic development. I think that uh, everybody needs to be involved in it. 
the chamber needs to be involved and maybe that is the person to gather everything but <laughs> growth new growth growth in the town we have, need to know where we can put it what kind of businesses do we want how do we want to develop this um, it's not just let's hire a person to do this because that's going to be not not such an easy thing to do yeah. I've done it and it's failed in places so I think that's it, a fair point you know <laughs> we're gonna look at the I growth mean, picture Mary Jo I wake up every day saying okay where can I go find another project to work on no one brings it to me I have to go find it and if I don't go find it I don't make any money so it's what a lot of people do for a living is they go out and make things happen they make it rain yeah. but th this is this the right is person I think could move the needle on our commercial tax base but we're, we're not going to find out until we invest in that person and see what happens we're going to look at all of a growth study not just economic development growth study I'm confused. we have to look at our residential growth study too because we're going to have to make big changes if yeah we well that's what I asked early on that's this is one piece of what these folks are looking at it's a piece um, it's just the revenue side for balancing it out a little bit we still have a big residential growth problem in town <laughs> and that's a different thing to, to talk about but the idea that the town should consider investing in an economic development officer whatever you want to call them um, you know based on the fact that it hasn't worked in the past we've never really focused on it in the past the town of Hoppington hasn't and for someone that's a professional sales type that has professional salespeople that get up every day and say what am I going to do and they got to go find something to do or they're going to be out of a job it can happen it can happen through, through the chair if I could uh, just to respond to Mary Jo's comment a little bit we did um, in our committee but I don't think it made it into the document we talked a lot about how this person will really need to do outreach with the community too to find out what sort of businesses do the communities want because that is important if if they try to bring in businesses that nobody wants anyway then it's not it's not going to work out but so part of the job should be outreach I think with the community the businesses the residents especially those that live near the business zones I mean I think if, I think if you're able to define a job role very well and you find the right skill set I think to Mr. Hur's point, you get a hunter, that person hunts. And they're out there to bring in that business. And it'll pay for itself. Right? The numbers, if that person hits the goals, and I'd incentivize that person. I would not necessarily put in just a staff salary. I think you can actually do it like a contract for three years. You invest 300 k and you put a carrot out there for that person, a tiered carrot for hitting certain numbers. You get the right person. Well, I mean, you mentioned Marlboro, and I know with Cimarano Drive and then with... Um, they put in a lot of whole shopping centers, mm -hmm. you know, with the groceries, like, like the plaza we have up here. But they have them in a number of places in their community that has, has brought in a lot of money. But do we have land for something like that? I mean, do we have the ability to do something like that? This is what... That'll be part of the broader kind of, I think, proposals that we bring forth or ideas that we bring forth. We know what the what the zoned areas are today. Right? Can they can be they be changed? Or we're going to report it back to the planning board to potentially make some re recommendations. And I think it all has to work in concert together if it's going to be successful. Fair point. So, first of all, Fran, I miss having you on open space. <laughs> <laughs> I miss being there. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Amy, Amy, this presentation went in front of the planning board it a couple did. of weeks ago. How did you guys vote on that? Uh, we did not vote on it. They actually had a lot of questions asked us to do more research, which we have done in the meantime, but we have not brought it back to the planning board yet. They generally seemed favorable, but they wanted to see more numbers about how much it would need to bring in in order to be revenue, at least neutral. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can bring it to them again, though, and let you know. So we as a select board uh, by charter... Uh, we don't get involved in the day-to-day -day running. So we can't look at Mr. Kamalu and say, I want you to put $100,000 aside to, to do a, um, you know, economic, um, uh, what are you doing? Development. 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 I'm sorry. Um, but we, I mean, he certainly, I mean, Mr. Gattino, like, to his point, since I've been on this board, Mr. Gattino has been throwing that term around for mm -hmm. four years now. Um, so how is the staffing proposal uh, linked to the charge? Of the growth study committee? Yeah. 
Let's see. Have to look up what our aims are. Uh, proactively manage growth. Um, I mean, I, you I, mean, I look at it right there. Full stop right there. Proactively manage growth. It's managing the commercial growth, balancing out with the residential growth, and kind of having a vision for 2025 or 2030 that there is some balance and, and the residents are going to be overburdened with the tax base if we're, we don't continue to kind of maintain or grow our fair share of the commercial base out there. Because you look at the growth, and again, depending on how you want to define growth, we'll just use the kind of macro term, you look at the commercial growth in, in Westboro, you look at the commercial growth in, in, in Marlboro, and you can even look at the commercial growth in Milford, I would argue that they're growing at a higher rate, so their fair share of the market basket is increasing vis-a-vis -vis what we have here in Hopkinton, yeah. right? And my goal, I think the goal here is, right, we don't necessarily have to beat them, but we want to be kind of there. If the tide is rising, we want to be rising equally yep. as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, I guess just kind of a procedural thing, you're just asking us to kind of float this around and, and get it in front of us, because you know, obviously where your work isn't done, um, you know, you wouldn't right. be saying. And we can't really make this happen. Right. We can just bring this idea that we've heard forward yep. in our research. And, and it was nice, hold on, it was nice, um, it's kind of appropriate that you guys came before us today and we had those three businesses come before yeah. us. Um, and I know just kind of driving through the center of town, uh, it looks like we're, we've got to be getting close to 100% uh, capacity now. It's nice to see a lot of these empty storefronts being filled. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I think that uh, Hopkins in the next couple of years will probably be a tough sell for a lot of these businesses with the Main Street Corridor project going on. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, I, I think uh, I, I totally agree with you that, you know, what, what do you say, we're 86-14 now? 84-16. Yeah. So, yeah, so 80-20 is a great benchmark to try to get to. 70-30 uh, would be perfect. You know, I don't want to be Westboro. I definitely don't want to be Marlboro. Um, and I don't want to be Wellesley. So, you know, there, there's, a, there's definitely a balance in there, I think, for everything. Um, but, I mean, I definitely thank you for coming up and making your presentation today. One quick one. How come we're such a hard sell to the planning board when, when there's two members of the planning board on the committee? I'm not, I'm not a voting member. I just can visit and yeah. talk a little bit. When, when it's so based on planning and you know we're based on uh, on the uh, uh, on the extended look for the town and everything why was it a hard sell for the plenty boy I, I, if it's well the majority of them actually spoke favorably about it but favorably about it but we um, we didn't have the presentation as put together as we do tonight when we brought it to them so based on their feedback we went back and did additional research so I don't and you can watch the tape but I don't think they were really negative about it they just wanted more information. But I can get a more firm answer from them. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Fruit Street Bridge, Mass DOT. The select board will hear from John Westling and the representatives of Mass DOT regarding replacement of the Fruit Street Bridge over 495. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having us tonight. Thanks for coming in. My name is Ryan McNeil. I am the Mass DOT project manager for the I-90-495 interchange improvement project. This is Jonathan Kappas with HNTB Coordination uh, Corporation. The intent of the presentation tonight is to solicit the board's input on what the approach is on Fruit Street to the bridge of 495, Fruit Street over 495 are going to look like. Mm -hmm. Fruit Street is a local road. Uh, that happens to be associated with the interchange improvement projects. I can talk about that a little bit. Um, but it's a local road, and we truly want the select board's input, the town manager's input. We've met with several of the town departments, and I think the presentation that you have in your packet and that we're going to show tonight has a, a unanimous uh, support from, from the boards, but um, from the department. But we, but we wanted the opportunity to present to you tonight. Um, the the 495-90 interchange improvement project is an important project for the Commonwealth that we're aggressively developing. As part of that project, we are required to replace the Fruit Street over 495 bridge. Uh, the vertical clearance over 495 is too low for the future configuration, and the piers, the existing piers and the existing abutments 
or in the way of the future alignment. So we're going to be replacing that bridge. Uh, as part of that <coughs> bridge replacement due to constructability uh, and staging requirements, that bridge is going to be wide enough for two 11-foot lanes, two 5-foot shoulders, one on either side, and one 5-and-a-half-foot sidewalk on the other side. That's, that's what the bridge replacement is going to be. Uh, beyond that, the approach work from Saddle Hill Drive to Huckleberry, uh, again, is a town road. Uh, we've got a, 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 a concept here tonight that I think has support from the town boards that we, we'd like to show you. So with that, I turn it over to Jonathan to uh, show a photo of the existing bridge. Yes, so sir. just a quick then, question. Yes, sir. Mr. Westerling, is um, Fruit Street a scenic road? So really, we're we're bound by a lot of stuff. We can't really cut trees or widen the road too much. Or, Chairman, we made that uh, point when we met on January 27th that it's, uh, any relocation or movement of walls requires the planning board to weigh in on it through a scenic road plan application, as do the cutting or removal of any trees greater than three inches in diameter. Yep. Okay. Okay. And we're going to talk about those impacts a little bit here. And again, we're, we're providing you uh, an option for your consideration. Uh, we're really looking for a unified voice from the town on what you'd like us to do uh, for fruit street approaches. Okay. Yep, so I'll, I'll skip ahead since Ryan covered a lot of uh, these items. Uh, the fruit street, fruit street scope again adds a sidewalk on the south side and bike lanes in each direction from Saddle Hill Road to Huckleberry Road. Uh, we are also, as a course of um, the need to raise the vertical clearance on Fruit Street, will improve the site distance and the substandard vertical curve that is currently at the intersection of Fruit Street and Saddle Hill Road. And I'll show that in a picture. Can I just uh, jump in real quick? The, the bike lane you referenced there, is that on the road? Yes, sir. So that's in the, it's in the pavement, it's in the right of way for the road? Yes. It won't be a raised bike lane or anything like that, so we don't need a lot of input about bike lanes because that's just the way it's going to be done. Right? Correct. In fact, the, uh, because of the short nature of this project, we wouldn't actually mark it as a bike lane. It would just be a, a shoulder wide enough to be a bike lane. Probably best not to talk about bike lanes in Hockington. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we just went through a Fair enough. big process, so I'd drop that if I were you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, so the photo you see right here is a look at the existing bridge um, on the Fruit Street Bridge looking towards Saddle Hill Road. Uh, off in the distance is the substandard vertical curve. Uh, you can see here at a closer image, you can see that the car is just cresting over and you're fairly close to it. So it's, there's not a lot of distance between you and being able to see over that curve. And just a couple other views. This is facing towards Huckleberry Road now. Mm -hmm. uh, so the overall plan, um, starting from Huckleberry Road and traveling east, uh, we would add a sidewalk on the southern side of the roadway. And you can see there's a new crosswalk across Huckleberry Road connecting to the sidewalk that is on Huckleberry Road. Uh, we would cross over Fruit Street. and then continue all the way to Saddle Hill Road. Uh, you can see those two shoulders on either side. There is no sidewalk on the northern side, and this cross-section is consistent with the cross-section on the other MassDOT project for Fruit Street over the MBTA and Sudbury River. Uh, two quick views of the cross-section. Uh, this is the cross-section that would be on the bridge. Uh, this is what is needed to construct the bridge and, main, and maintain traffic on the bridge. Got a Porsche. <laughs> when you draw cars BMW. for rendering, sometimes you want to have fun and draw cars that are fun to draw. <laughs> Next time, can you do the Budweiser Clyde? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like a drag race on first. And then this is a section um, you can see. I'll flip back very quickly. Uh, there is a section line through Fruit Street, uh, just uh, east of the driveways, and that's where we're looking at this cross section right here. So you can see that there is a, a, an existing wall at the top of the hillside that would be relocated to the back of the sidewalk 
as a result of the widened roadway. Uh, there are within the town right away 47 trees that would be impacted. Um, however, the benefits would be full bicycle accommodation and pedestrian accommodation on the southern side of the road. I get a question to the chair. Uh, um, this is logistics. Is this going to be built sort of like the Como Bridge next to the Tappan Zee? They're adjacent to each other. Are we going to be, be without a connector for, for months? Is this one, is the Fruit Street Bridge coming down and then a new one going up? Or, is, or are we going to, you know, it's... I'll give the general answer, and if you want more details, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan. The answer is, to that is no. It'll be staged construction. It'll be staggered. Uh, the, the current plan is to have one lane crossing the bridge at all times during construction. It'll be controlled by temporary traffic signals on either end, but you will have that passageway uh, throughout the duration of construction. Okay, Chris. So we can, we can click back and look through those typical cross-sections, but uh, in general, we're working diligently towards a 25% design submittal. Um, the, there'll be a, a design, 25% design public hearing out here in, in, in the towns. Um, probably May, June of this year, where we'll kind of roll out the, the overall design to general public and stakeholders and anybody who wants to, uh, who has any interest. We've already had a couple dozen presentations in this building and across the street in Westboro and Bolton and kind of all over the place to really to, get, to, to kind of gather the regional feedback on uh, the project in general, but alternatives in specific. All of those meetings have focused on the interchange. Again, we're here tonight because it's a, it's a local road, and we truly like your opinion on, on how you'd like to, us to approach this. I've been to a bunch of those meetings. So. Okay. Yeah, excellent. So. From us, Mr. Kamala, there's really nothing for us to do right now, right? This is just kind of an informative, or, or do we need to act on something? Um, there's a need for action, uh, namely um, that mm -hmm. staff has presented a recommendation in support of the plan as presented tonight. Therefore, the ask is for the select board to authorize the town manager to submit a letter of support mm -hmm. for the project as presented uh, to the appropriate authorities. So then, uh, through the chair then, I'll, I'll make a motion to submit a letter to MassDOT supporting the proposed improvements to the Fruit Street Bridge approaches as, as presented and discussed this evening. Excellent. I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? Mr. Yes. Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Nasrullah. <laughs> Um, the uh, is it uh, the DOT regulations that require the, the the sidewalk and the bike lane on the bridge? Because when I look at this, I, there's there's no sidewalk leading up to it, and there's no sidewalk after it. So correct. It seems it seems silly to have it there. We have this conversation quite a bit, and, mm -hmm. and I don't know enough about the Main Street project to delve into the particulars of that project and the process that, that you went through. So then we won't. But, but I would say they're I would say they're very much apples and oranges project. Yeah. Um, this aspect, the Fruit Street aspect of this project is, is basically just a bridge replacement project. We are replacing that bridge. It's not a corridor improvement project. It's not in a town center. It's a, a local. Um, I'm not sure what the functional classification of it is, mm -hmm. but the bridge local. replacement project on a local road uh, that doesn't have a lot of through traffic or connectivity. So for the bridge portion of it, we are providing the five foot shoulders on either side and the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Generally how we do things these days so that mm -hmm. when we build infrastructure, it's built yep. and it can be connected in the past. Um, in regards to Fruit Street, again, it's a local road. So uh, that, that's why we're here in front of you tonight to, to yep. hear your preferences. Okay. A significant percentage of the Hopkinton residents use that interchange, the 495 Pike interchange, all the time. And we all get stuck there. So we get it, and I don't think the town has any issue with improving that intersection any way and we support it any way we can. <laughs> I saw one thing on the slide that will draw some ire in town, and you should be ready for it. Not necessarily from me, but where it saw, I saw 47 trees were impacted. 
mm -hmm. uh, that will cause a stir. So we're going to need to address that one way or the other. Uh, it used to be three things in town got everyone crazed, trees, trash, and trails. Now you can add bike lanes to that discussion, and you've got two of the four uh, in that slide there. So I think we just need to be ready for that and figure out why we have to take out 47 trees or do whatever we got to do with 47 trees. Some folks will be concerned about that, and I think right, rightly so, but yep. I support the project and I support improving the intersection in general. And, and that's a fantastic point. And again, that's why we're here in front of this board tonight, and that's why we're looking for a consistent across the board opinion support from the town realizing that we'll go to the planning board for those trees but again if, if it's a town decision to do this with the pros and the cons um, that that might be a, a little bit an easier avenue so I'd encourage you to do whatever due diligence you feel like you need at this level but also other boards and, and speak with your other departments and, and kind of get a consistent voice um, we're, we're, this is an important project for the Commonwealth and we're developing it aggressively and I want to make the town Fruit Street part of the process as efficient and seamless as possible I'm not interested in kind of battling against across department so I really appreciate a, a consistent message from the town I appreciate you coming up and taking the time to make the presentation happy to do so uh, that said, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstain? Carries. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. FY21 budget review. The select board will review the FY21 capital requests. Mr. Kamala. Uh, at your at its last meeting, the select board reviewed the operating budgets uh, from the town side. Uh, tonight, we are looking strictly at the capital projects. Uh, and first on the list, I think we're going to make it very simple. Uh, I think we'll ask the police department to present your capital articles. Good evening. Good evening. Through the chair, uh, on behalf of Chief Lee, apologize for him, he can't be here, he's also sick. Um, to, this year we're requesting one, one capital item, $153,000 to replace three cruisers. Uh, it's like those are replacements, not expansions. Lieutenant Porter uh, oversees all the vehicle maintenance and manages the capital, so I brought him uh, if you have any questions. No, I mean, this is <clears throat> something that comes before us every year, and I think we attempted to kick some of the, uh, not we, but some of the people, old board members, I mean, we, I can't even say old board members, uh, past board members uh, tried to kick the can down the road a little bit, and uh, uh, I don't think we have a, this is, there's no wiggle room here, right, Mr. Kamala? In, in fact, this is a modest request, considering that they're only looking for replacement and not for, not accounting for the increase in size of the force. Right. Right. So, um, what do you need from us when, when these come up? I mean, are we saying we approve them? Or are we saying? No. At this point, simply ask questions, and at some point, we'll go through the list. Okay. With a standing motion to approve. I have no questions. Okay. Well, I, 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 to that to that point that we're just doing replacements. Now we just hired three more officers. Uh, you know, the, the, the most important just Those three officers replaced the three that left. We didn't expand our force. We okay. expanded by one. Okay, I just want to make sure that, that, that we're, getting, we're getting people, we're getting officers out. You know, and, and if, we're, if we're not getting more vehicles, are we, uh, are we using all of our officers in the most efficient ways? So, uh, Lieutenant Porter and I spoke of this. Uh, we actually had grown during the period where our officers were out injured before, prior to the retirement. So there are additional bodies. Um, and could we use four? Sure. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to end up with uh, increasing the number of officers in, in a cruiser, increasing the idle time, increasing the miles. But um, Chief asked for three at this point, given the, given the budget and, and, and just. I'm just going in my head picturing two of the old Don Day and John Litchfield in the same there cruiser. <laughs> and it's uh, very comical. <laughs> but fortunately, you're hiring all young little guys so and people, so they'll fit. <laughs> uh, I have no other questions for the 
for the real quick. So it's basically fifty one thousand per cruiser. That's fully outfitted and correct. That's so okay. there's a transition year going on where we're, we're trying to switch to um, hybrid vehicles mm -hmm. uh, to for gas mileage and for longer li mm -hmm. longevity in the long run with the vehicles. So unfortunately, by switching to them, um, the increased jumped a little bit because a lot of the old equipment won't fit into the new style cars. Um, okay. Once we start transitioning over, you'll, we'll start seeing a, a level playing on the, uh, on the transition fees. Mm -hmm. Additionally, uh, Lieutenant manages a replacement program. We don't replace every single thing in the car. You know, there's technology that is on a replacement cycle, and depending on what he can, he replaces when he can. Uh, you know, a model change is devastating. It's yeah. all new cages and everything. Yep. So, uh, you know, we try to get, you know, five years out of our modems and, and, and laptops, and the radios last even longer. So all those components get are on their own replacement cycle as well as the cars. So that's kind of what I was getting at, is, like, the technology is going to be included in the 51, right? That, that's enough to, yes, sir. to get you up and running again. Yes. Okay. Um, I don't know if you guys can answer this or not, but is that number that uh, 153,000 is that net of trade or is that that does not include the trade okay perfect and uh mr stickney's working you've been working with mr stickney on the to auction the cars we're going to uh, try that yes so we're going to try we, we don't I mean, get any money not from mhq yeah um so we're going to try this year to put our uh, ourselves put the deals out to bid yeah and see if we can create greater revenue I have a suggestion. At the carnival, a buck a whack with the sledgehammer. <laughs> and when you're done, donate it to the fire department for training. <laughs> Sell tickets to that. You Get your fourth cruiser. Yeah. Okay. But thanks, guys. Okay, thank, thank you. All. That's it. Nothing else. No. no That's other it. Fun things. Oh. Well, <laughs> Hearing nothing else. <laughs> Yeah, through the chair, next is uh, the fire department with three requests. Okay. Good evening, Chief. Mr. Kamau, are all these capital items going to be on free cash, or what are you thinking as far as funding? Um, if you look at, I think it's Exhibit 5, we have identified uh, the possible funding sources. Uh, and specifically for the police department... Give me one second. So we got these pages ago. Yeah. The funding source should be. I'm assuming it's free cash, but I'll, I'll get to that specifically, Mr. K. One second. Elaine, do you have another copy, a hard copy of that? While he's going, Chief, let's have it. We got it last week. So I have uh, three capital items. The first one is a receiver site. Mm -hmm. We have a uh, area in town in East Hoppington that is um, especially weak for uh, our uh, units when they're out on a portable radio. Um, part of it is uh, when we did the Verizon switchover, the uh, police had a, uh, a location out in Holliston that reached into that area. It would have been cost prohibitive for us to try to utilize that site to continue on with Verizon. We were hoping to pick it up with our Kinder Morgan um, site, which is covering all the new development over on the uh, northeast side, but it's not covering it well. So um, this proposal includes, um, we've started to have an assessment so that we can verify that uh, a site, should it be found, covers it. Um, I just got the literally yesterday got some of the uh, paperwork back that shows some of the areas that we're looking at would probably do it. Um, there's still a little bit of cost question here um, on, on uh, if it's not a, say, a town-owned building or an easily accessible site, it could add another twenty dollars to $25,000 for some specialty equipment to uh, complete it. Yep. 
That's a short story. Okay. I'm going to do all three. Sure. So the second proposal is uh, our engine four. It was uh, it's slated to actually last us another ten years. It's struggling right now with a lot of uh, rot um, in the areas, especially in the underneath, getting into some of the the railings. Um, so I don't know if you have the report, but we did an extensive report on it. Uh, had our uh, vendor just go through it head to tail when we did our last chassis inspection. And we would e need to do something this year to have it extend out if we wanted to grab the whole 10 years as designed. <coughs> um, if not, it's going to go quickly from this point on. So um, I have another engine coming up in two years. I like this engine. I think it's worth investing a hundred grand now and getting 10 years out of it versus trying to rush in and add another today's money is six hundred fifty thousand dollars for an engine so there's a little bit of math there mm -hmm. talked it through with the finance people I, I think it's kind of a judgment call on everybody for me knowing we have another engine coming in two years a fire station uh, public safety study um, I think this might be the opportunity to do this type of a refurbishment the hundred thousand is I built in a little extra to make sure it will come in. There's been some unknowns on a engine, but I, I think this is the right one to do it. Yep. And then the station alerting upgrade. In the, uh, I'm sorry. Station alerting upgrade. So station alerting, um, just part of when the uh, the reconnecting of uh, of the um, how should I say this? The one we put in about uh, six years ago is connected with an old fire alarm wire. When we do downtowning, we were doing some studying of conduit to lay. Uh, the opportunity to switch to fiber right now and to have a piece of equipment that would go to another public safety building, the existing equipment won't do it. So we just kind of assessed it right now. Um, you'd have to come up with something to reconnect them anyways. So I think it's worth spending the money right now to get the upgraded piece of equipment. It would also add a final piece that um, we currently can open two doors only from the dispatch center to the fire station when we're all gone mm -hmm. um it would take this next step where it, we just got the new doors in the new door equipment and this piece of equipment would actually do all the doors remotely so those are the three things that said it's worth doing it now then trying to push it out five years from now um and and spend some money on the existing equipment and trying to keep it going <coughs> thanks chief board nothing Nothing. good thank you Great job, Chief. Thanks, Chief. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, through the chair, as we're setting, yeah, setting up, um, in answer to Mr. Hare's question, the 153000 uh, for the three cruiser replacements uh, is coming from uh, free cash, and as well as the station alerting upgrade for seventy, and the engine for replacement at 100000 uh, if you look at the exhibit that we included in your meeting packet, town manager is recommending zero for the communication reserve aside uh, because we believe we can work with the chief to find some funding this year to be <coughs> done. Uh, it's urgent. It needs to be done. Okay. Thank you. Who's next on the agenda? Yeah, next is uh, IT. Good evening. Hi, Josh. <coughs> how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Welcome aboard. Thank you. I've got uh, four uh, capital requests for uh, technology this year. Uh, the first is uh, $55,000. This is to uh, upgrade the core fiber optic network, the municipal area network um, that is in existence today between town buildings. Um, this is really being opportunistic um, in kind of jumping on the, the downtown corridor project and being able to upsize that fiber. Um, it's going to be buried underground, uh, kind of future proofs us. Um, this is not something that we would want to be revisiting five years from now, right? So if, if we're ever going to do it, this is t t the, the time to, um, to put that fiber in. Um, and it's also uh, uh, the last step required in order to uh, allow us to move the town's data center from town hall to the police department so that's something that we we started that project uh, with the firewall upgrade that was done last year 
Um, this would allow us to complete that, gives us our, our data center in a building that's staffed 24-7. Um, backup power, right? There's a, there's a lot of reasons that that, that makes sense. Um, allows us to keep the existing um, hub at Town Hall as well. So this gives us flexibility in future years for, for backup redundancy, uh, ability to have a hot site here at the Town Hall. Okay. Thank you. Um, second is a routine ongoing request um, we do on a yearly basis just for the for the planned replacement of uh, computers mm -hmm. for town staff so this is something that we spread out over a refresh cycle um, we don't have the, the resources to replace all 170 uh, town employee computers in any one particular year so we do this kind of on an ongoing basis um, earmark a three and a half year lifespan for laptops a five plus year lifespan for desktops and just recycle them on that on that pattern uh, the request for this year is forty three thousand seven hundred dollars um, that lets us do uh, 39 devices uh, third request is for thirty four thousand four hundred twenty dollars uh, this is to replace four of the town's oldest multifunction printers. Uh, so these are the large floor standing MFPs, copy, print, scan, fax. Uh, yes, they still fax. <laughs> um, and, and so the four that we're replacing, again, are the oldest uh, in the fleet of 14 that we have. So by October of this calendar year, uh, these devices will be between 7 and 10 years old. We've, we've gotten our money's worth out of the, the existing four. Um, and then lastly is um, fire department, police department, exterior camera replacements. These are for four remaining cameras um, at police and fire that were, that were installed as part of the original buildings and um, are, are just due for, for replacement at this point. Um, of note for the for the fire department and, and police department cameras um, we've asked and budgeted for thirty four thousand nine hundred thirty one dollars um, two of those four cameras that are planned to be replaced are um, remote at the police department so these are external cameras not mounted on the building so there's some underground conduit that's that's part of that um, this is on the high end assuming the worst so once work, um, you know, if approved, once work were to commence, um, there is a chance that on the on the most um, best case scenario is that this could decrease by twelve to thirteen thousand dollars, right? But we won't know that until absolutely not. The best case scenario is it will decrease by thirty-four thousand. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Semantics. A pretty good scenario. Twelve thousand dollars. Three cases the funding source for the four. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, this is very nominal. This is considering the size of our town and everything else. This is great. All right. Thank you. Board have anything? No. Nope. You lost me on IT, so I still have an Atari at home. So it's excellent. You're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Next is uh, facilities. Hi, Dave. Is that all you? Thank you, Dave. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, good evening. Um, first off, um, under the uh, pay as you go, uh, we have a pl police station uh, roof repair, more of a reshingling of the police station. Um, it's uh, an estimated currently at about $100,000. Um, most of it's because, you know, it'll be a costly type of project. Uh, we're still negotiating with the solar company um, for the process of removing those solar panels, possibly upgrading them, uh, and returning them to where they are. Um, so currently right now it's just a $100,000 project. Um, we've looked into warranty from the original construction. Um, we still have some discussions with the actual shingle manufacturer, um, Slim Chance, but we'll try. Um, maybe it was a, a faulty product they, that they gave us, which caused the shingles to kind of curl. But um, what I'm looking at is, is the likely cost. Um, 
of doing the reshingling project. So if those get warrantied, all they're going to do is warranty the product, not the labor, right? Correct. Right. Saves us some. Saves us some. Um, okay. Board, anything? Is that it, Dave? Just um, the one? Oh, this no. one that's uh, no, no, it's yeah. no. Uh, the general fund. I have the um, uh, town hall parking lot construction, and this is the construction of a parking lot on the uh, the old Marquardt property behind town hall. Yeah. Um, it was last town meeting. I think approved funding to purchase that property. Um, it's a three hundred thousand um, dollars, and that would be for a, a parking lot with with with, um, with lights. Um, so there is a bit of a cost there associated with, with providing a load center for the lights. Um, right now, it would be to demolish the existing building, but that's still to be determined um, at a final date, I think. <laughs> yeah, we can't so. determine. We, we can't demolish something we don't own yet. Correct. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this is the parking lot on Walcott Street. We're talking Correct. Oh, okay. How many spaces? Um, a, a, a draft layout of the parking lot was about 30 spaces. 30? Good. Okay. And it includes the, the cost for design, permitting, construction, the, the whole. Yep. Well, there's a the permitting process. Okay. Is a, All right. And, and the last one. Yeah, you don't, I don't even think you need to get into the I don't want to bring up. I don't want to. Thank you for the time. Exactly. I don't want to yeah. yeah. bring up the last one if I don't no. have to. Yeah. yeah, no, you don't even have to get into it. Exactly. Okay. We're running late, and that's. Right. We're not even going to talk so it's about just, that. Just those two items. All right. Thank you. To the people at home, we just saved you 15 million bucks. <laughs> so, when I see it, the spoon, don't yell at me. Okay. Um, it's joined quickly. Before we get to the schools. All right. Yeah, John. Yeah. Good evening again. Through the chair, I am here representing capital request for three divisions within the Department of Public Works. Do you have any particular order that you prefer? Most important to least important. All right. So, for the highway division, we have a request of $51,000 to replace a 27 year old chipper that does not have modern safety features and puts our employees at risk of serious injury when chipping trees and brush. The next is $84,000 for the addition of a mini excavator, which costs $66,500, a trailer to haul it at $7,900, and a hammer at $8,900 to assist with winter burials in our cemeteries and excavations in our streets. Mini excavator will improve the efficiency of our operations in our cemeteries and reduce the disruptions to existing burial plots and help the DPW to conform to the new Department of Labor standards laws related to safety. We have a request of $255,000 to replace an 18-year-old street sweeper. This is one of two street sweepers that are necessary to clean more than 110 miles of public streets, which takes us about four months to complete with two sweepers. Our street sweeping requirements increased by 50% last year as a requirement of the EPA's National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permit, which now requires us to sweep half of our streets twice per year once in the spring and once in the fall, once all the leaves fall off the trees. And those are the streets down towards Milford, which are in the Charles River Basin. It's in an effort to reduce phosphorus loading. And the last for the highway division is $120,000 to replace an existing stacked boulder wall on Elm Street at the intersection of Wood Street, which poses a threat to the motoring public because it is not structurally sound and loose boulders fall off into the travel way. The existing wall is also too close to the edge of pavement and gets struck by truck traffic. So on that one, that was one that would, before you were here, that would routinely get hit by Harvey's trailers. Um, and I know that um, it's been you know, Mickey Mouse throughout the years. Um, I don't, okay. Board, do you have anything on these? Okay. Uh, the next is for the sewer enterprise fund. There is one request there of $53,000 to replace an eight year old pickup truck that has 106,000 miles on it and a repair history of $25,000. And that truck is integral to our daily operations in the sewer division. Okay. And then in the water enterprise fund, 
Well, the first is a request of $40,000 for the, re the cleaning of two Alprilla farm wells, the only two Alprilla farm wells, mm -hmm. to maximize their water supply volume and water supply quality. It essentially cleans the screens and rejuvenates the production, the production of the wells. We also have a request of $275,000 to replace 900 feet of cast iron water main on Woody Island Road that is the sole domestic and firefighting water supply for 14 homes. The existing water main burst last fall and during our repair we discovered a paper thin walled water pipe that has corroded over time and will only be a matter of time before it bursts again. And then we have a placeholder request of $195,000 for the engineering costs associated with the next steps related to the regulatory approval of the Pratt Farm well field, including but not limited to preparation of the Water Management Act permit, the Environmental Notification Form, and the Interbasin Transfer Act. And that is a placeholder because we are currently evaluating the option or the possibility of having two uh, uses on that property um, a, a CSA, which stands for community supported, community supported agriculture. Thank you very much, uh, and how that how that can work together with a, a well field on the property. And the last is a placeholder request of six point five million dollars for the replacement of the second Grove Street water tank to comply with DEP requirements and to construct a high pressure water system. This tank provides operating storage, emergency storage, and equalization storage. The high pressure system will improve the necessary domestic and firefighting water pressures to the greater downtown area around Grove Street, Hayden Row, and the high school. So, uh, board? No? Good. Real quick on the, uh, the Grove Street tank replacement. Um, how urgent is that? my question. <laughs> uh, through the chair, we have two tanks there. Two years ago we replaced uh, the beautiful blue one that's there now. Uh, the older one, it has been inspected and we found that there is the interior lining of that tank has deteriorated and there is also <coughs> rot and um, general deterioration of the rivets and the steel inside. So how urgent is it? We have been asking DEP for some leeway as we evaluate our options and they have done that and allowed us two years time worth of delaying our option that we select. So it's imminent if we don't go back to DEP with a plan and a timeline and a funding source that they will come likely come through with a consent order for us to make immediate uh, either taking that tank offline, well, that's what they would do, but we would then have to come up with a plan to replace it because we need that for equalization, uh, emergency storage. So we, d we don't have a lot of options left uh, mm -hmm. other than to replace it in some form. And there are a few options that we're evaluating as staff with our engineers and our finance department mm -hmm. and the town mm -hmm. manager's office. Um, but uh, it's replacement of the tank and construction of a high pressure system in that greater downtown area. Was that, was that six and a half million in the debt schedule that we used as we calculated and decided on the rates uh, for last, last year or this year, I guess? Yes, it was. So we kind, of, we kind of budgeted for it a little bit already, but when we made those increases on the water rates and sewer rates? So through the chair, we are looking at what the impact of that will do to the rates. Um, the, there's been some inflation of the cost due to material costs and the like, uh, but we are looking at, before we come through with a final recommendation, what that will do to the rate structure before we make our final approval, final recommendation. Okay. Hey. Got to do it. We got to do it. I have a question. Uh, super duty utility truck and then street sweeper. Are they both sweepers? Uh, through the chair, the super duty truck, which there's, 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 it's the last one under project. It's 96,000, which Mr. Kamalo recommended. Nothing, uh, yeah, but no that action. was 96,000. And that's then not a street sweeper. That's a, that's a truck. So okay, he didn't chair. mention it. So, and then we had the street sweeper. So, 
The reason I didn't Maybe. mention it was because it wasn't moved forward through yeah. the town manager's review. Okay. okay. Mr. Westling, is the reason tank number two is in questionable status? I'm trying to figure out. I've been I've been hit recently with a few people that were asking why that temporary fencing remains around those water tanks. It's a permanent I, fence now. That's a permanent fence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, are you referring to the six-foot cyclone fence that's around that? Chain, I don't know if it's cyclone. Chain, it's chain, chain link fence. Yeah. So that uh, that was there previously at a smaller area. But we found uh, that there was some lead paint contamination in that soil, so we expanded it uh, to a small degree out towards uh, Grove Street just to contain all of that area. But fencing around water tanks is required anyway. You'll see it up at uh, West Main Street, there's also a fence around that one uh, to limit anyone's ability to access the property, to mess with the controls, to climb yeah. the tank. Not that we've ever climbed the tanks as kids. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, so the, the fact that our town water supply is right there and you just told me that the ground is contaminated with lead, that's a huge red flag for me right now. So for clarification, I uh, perhaps misspoke. It's not a source of water supply, it's water storage. So there's no interaction between the tanks and the water in them and the soil around it. Mm -hmm. And the reason that the, the was protected with uh, the fence is because the, the lead in the soil it doesn't pose a threat unless it's ingested. So you can't get it by walking on the soil. You've got to actually ingest the soil before you have any, any problems whatsoever with lead poisoning. Not that we yeah, I know I'm very familiar with lead poisoning and how it happens, but with three of our schools right there and having that have be a known contaminant, I don't know why we haven't. And it's probably above the more, you know, not in the scope of what, which I practice, but uh, it concerns me that we would have something, some, something fenced off with lead contamination that close to three schools. So we, lo we looked at that previously, and this was maybe four years ago, um, when we found that there was, we did, we did sampling around the tanks before we did any of the work on the tank itself. Um, and what we found was that the levels were no different than you would find around an older home that's painted with lead. But because it's public property and because it was near the schools, we worked with the superintendent at the time to find the best way to limit access and limit exposure to that soil. And what was determined at the time was that a fence would be the most economical way to prevent anyone accessing that. So I was off on a tangent. That, that has nothing to do with our capital items. So that's my fault for going off. I'm sorry about that. I would bring forward a capital item for soil remediation if, if we chose a different route. Maybe we could put it through our insurance. How's that? Moving on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Schools? Good evening. Good evening. Uh, so in, in your packet, I think starting on page 198 is the presentation that I made for the capital plan, which I'll just run through uh, quickly. Uh, the first item is the HVAC uh, district-wide, and this represents two units, one at the high school, one at Hopkins. And this will begin a systematic plan of replacing these larger units. Um, there's currently 38 of these units throughout the district. So if we're only looking at two a year, it's a significant um, number of years before we get these all addressed. Um, so this is the beginning of, of that plan. Uh, the boiler replacement, this is the second of the two um, boilers that are at the middle school. Um, the first boiler is in the engineering and design phase currently, um, and these represent really the largest boilers that uh, we have in the district. Roof replacements, this is a partial roof replacement at both the Hopkins School and the Middle School. Um, there was an engineering um, test done on the roofs to determine which ones were Needed, in need of replacement, which ones could be repaired and, and the life extended a little bit. 
just as a point of reference in 2016 when we did the roof at the Hopkins um, there was an ad alternate to do the remaining part of the roof that was not funded at town meeting so this is that other piece of the roof that was part of that um, bid that was done in 2016 so and even at that some of this will still just be repaired and some will be replaced um, they do believe that they can repair and extend the life of a section of the Hopkins roof um, the middle school roof there is a significant amount that will be replaced um, there are parts of the roof that are covered with solar those are not part of the scope uh, so those will not be touched at this time uh, the vehicle this would represent in addition to the fleet for the maintenance staff um, mm -hmm. currently there are three trucks for eight maintenance staff and the vehicles are used for maintenance towing plowing sanding etc throughout the district and just increasing that fleet will improve the efficiency and effectiveness um, if there are more vehicles for the staff system-wide security upgrades this is the continuation uh, or the final year actually of the camera camera installations throughout the district and these were outlined in the security task force technology assessment plan um, technology upgrades these would represent an upgrade to the phone system which is actually a town-wide um, so that will be coordinated with Josh it's a town-wide replacement and the bell system for the schools so the district and the town IP offices and voicemail servers servers are at risk of failure without an upgrade and the bell system is over 20 years old the Elmwood feasibility study is to procure a study document to um, look at the educational program generate an initial space summary document existing conditions establish design parameters and develop and evaluate alternatives for the Elmwood school to be presented to the mass school building authority um, as you know we present a, or put it submitted an SOI last year to be invited in for Elmwood um, we have since been denied this past December January and we're in the process of submitting another statement of interest and we would not hear from the, about that until again next December January the White House exterior renovation uh, this would be replacement of the roof uh, replacing siding as needed and the windows uh, to continue to renovate the building so the interior was renovated during the summer there are currently both students and offices that are occupying this building uh, the costs were put together from an engineering report that was done by Habib and the wetlands order of conditions uh, this is to increase the amount of uh, appropriated to complete the wetland rest restoration uh, this wetland restoration is actually from the original development of fields when the high school was built so it's a very old uh, order of conditions the full cost to do what is uh, required is uh, costs hundred thousand dollars we had put forward that hundred thousand dollars last year it was reduced to forty thousand so this is to get the remaining appropriation to get to that hundred thousand and close out that order of conditions board is that it that's it I struggle with the White House exterior work I get what's going on inside and I like the programming that's going on in there I mean I talk by there a lot it's it's not perfect it's I don't I don't know if it's leaking or anything like that but um, it's just a lot of money it seems for that scope of work it's not a big I'm not gonna move the needle a whole lot but we're gonna have to still keep trying to figure out where we can save some money this year for the taxpayers so that's what I struggle with a little bit uh, I will say that if you look up if you go up into the attic and you look at the roof you see through it there's pinholes everywhere it looks like stars okay. so that's the unfortunate side about it and of course the fascia boards are missing so there's squirrels and birds that live in there as well so as long as we have animals that are infiltrating the building it will continue to be got it bad condition 
I just I don't question the the need for it. I quite that two hundred and six thousand dollars is a giant number. Giant. I, yeah, and and again, it was lifted right from the Habib engineering report. It okay. it's more costly when we do things um, with the um, prevailing wage, which is an unfortunate thing to look at. Um, one of the things that we are trying to do is just go out and at least get the price for the roof, because, yeah. like I said, the, you know, the roof and the fascia boards. If you have animals and you have pinholes everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not a pretty building to look at. Can we do without siding and paint for a while and windows? Uh, but I do think that the roof, at, at the very least, um, the roof and the fascia boards. That's a good idea. Let's look at yeah. that. Come back with a different number. Yeah, only two hundred six is I, insane. Yeah, I've got I've got a house like four houses away that I just completely redid, and it's about eight to ten times. It's the very cost. it's very different from residential. I, I agree with you. Uh, it's just wow, and I know that people. If, if it gets to town meeting, people are all yeah. going to say, "Wait, a minute, I just did my roof." And yeah. All right, um, Mr. Carlo. I know that the town manager recommendation is uh, not to fund, it, as well as the the order of conditions. Um, what's the plan there? Yeah. Thought um, process. The I, I had the same sentiment regarding the the White House, um, the wetland order of conditions. Um, if there's a way to find um, funds in FY20 to do this, that could be one avenue we could look into. Uh, but this is an issue that has been out there for for a while. Uh, I didn't see any immediate immediate need for us to do this, given the other things we want to <coughs> fund in the budget. Sure. And I, I'm trying to wrap my head around the Elmwood feasibility study. Um, Seven hundred thousand dollars is, is a pretty expensive gamble. I wouldn't do that in my house with my funds. I have a hard time justifying the town to do it on a, a gamble. Seven hundred thousand dollars. Right. I mean, the, the hope would be that we would be invited in with this next statement of interest. Um, I will say that the school committee is looking at putting together a community engagement group to elicit more discussions around both the capacity study that was done, the enrollment studies that were done, and really what is the future looking at the enrollment and the overcrowding in each of our buildings. What does it mean for each of each of these yeah. buildings, and how does that then flow into some type of feasibility study? Yeah. Um, so I think there is still more discussions. Okay. Do the chair? No, I I saw the the presentation with the uh, the new Elwood School near the other marathon, and it works great. But for the people that are, that are watching, can you explain the the seven hundred thousand? And I, I know we do this every year. And what happens with it? Do we lose the whole seven hundred thousand if we're not invited in? What do we get back, just so people understand before the town meeting? Because we're going to have to explain it again at town meeting. Correct. Um, so if we we would follow the MSBA process. Um, so with the the whole hope would be that we would be invited in, and then it would be reimbursable. There is always a potential that we never get invited in. So you know that is a very unfortunate reality to the MSBA and, and the building process. There are very few schools that are invited in, and typically their condition is much worse than where we are with the Elmwood School in, ter in the eyes of the rating system that, that the MSBA has put forward, not our eyes, the state's eyes. Um, they have very specific criteria and ratings that they put out there for the schools. And we do a good job of maintaining that school. So condition-wise, it's, it's not a failing building. Enrollment-wise, we're squeezed. Um, and then you take that and multiply it by all of our buildings, and, and we're squeezed everywhere. So if I could do a follow-up to the chair. So do you see it as a, as a good bet? Because you know, you know we, we might be going up against some city schools that are really in tough shape, you know. And, and you know, are we throwing good money after bad? Do we do we wait a little while? Or you know, you know, is is this the right time? Just in case. 
Well, we have time between now and town meeting. Um, we are in discussions with uh, Representative Dykema in the hopes of also having another meeting with the MSBA. Um, the MSBA did come out for a senior study to the Elmwood School this past fall, so we really thought that that was a good sign. Um, you know, the legislature has since also increased the funding to the MSBA, so is there a chance that we would get in? You, you know, again, it, it, it is a gamble, but we will have further conversations with the MSBA um, hopefully soon and, and before town meeting. Um, but, you know, the, the path is that, you know, we would absolutely want to partner with the MSBA. Thank you. Thank you. Through the chair, if I may add, um, these are certainly conversations going on at the school committee level about the feasibility study and the plan going forward. We're very thankful that the town has supported in both uh, at the special town meeting and also the special election yesterday in funding these portable classrooms uh, at Elmwood. So there is a conversation uh, coming up this Thursday at the school committee, looking at the capacity study, what is, you know, how are the growth patterns, and also as uh, Mr. Othamek alluded to, uh, uh, a community engagement committee that would look to elicit responses from the community, look to see what would the future hold. And uh, so we are certainly going through the process. When this was originally recommended by the school committee from a timeline perspective, it was um, in the December time frame. So those conversations are certainly happening. Okay. We're good? Well, well, well follow, because that's what I was worried about. Since we just voted for the new classrooms, will the Will the, uh, the group look at that and say, well, wait a minute, you guys did, did a great Band-Aid. You really don't need it right now. That's what my worry is that we did something really good. Well, uh, we did a great Band-Aid, but uh, did we hurt ourselves by doing that Band-Aid? The reality is they could look at it that way, but going into next year, we have to have places to put children. So. All right. Thank you. Mr. Kamalo. In terms of next steps, I believe uh, at the next scheduled select board meeting, we'll be asking the board to uh, take positions on the articles as well as uh, the operating budgets. Okay. Um, so we're all set with the um, annual town meeting articles right now? That's next. Okay. So, Mr. Cabal, we'll be asked to take That's positions I'm sorry. on articles that town meeting would be asking our position on. Mm we don't have to take positions on every article because town meeting won't even ask us what our yeah. opinion is on some of these. Yeah, to be specific, um, the select board will need to vote on a budget to be forwarded to the appropriations committee. And that budget includes both the operating budget as well as the capital budgets. Got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, Mr. Kamala, why don't you take us through the annual town meeting articles <coughs> if we're at that point? Yes, we're at that point now. Um, we have included two draft articles um, for your consideration. Um, we are not necessarily looking for immediate feedback. These are in your hands for future discussion. Namely, the draft trench safety officer by law and then the draft street opening permit by law. Again, as the assistant town manager is reminding me, uh, both don't um, represent any substantial change. They are simply codifying current practice. Okay. Well, what do you need from us, Mr. Kamala? Nothing right now. Move forward. Think about it. Good. Yeah. Think about it. Moving forward. <laughs> yeah. Um, Town manager report. I think the big news on the message corridor project is that the 100% design is now in Mastiotti's hands. Great. Can you restate that nice and clear, please? 
I want everyone to understand where we are. It's, it's exactly. very important. We've got to keep everyone updated. Exactly. Uh, the town's consultants, VHB, uh, have now submitted the 100% design to Mass DOT. Excellent. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Music to our ears. Yes. <coughs> and st staying on good news, um, 45 East Main Street. Um, I am now um, tonight respectfully asking the board to approve the award of the lease of the property located at 45 East Main Street to the 26.2 Foundation, uh, subject to the successful negotiation of a lease between the town and the 26.2 Foundation. Uh, the 26.2 Foundation providing information sufficient to satisfy the town with regard to the feasibility conditions that we outlined in the RFP and finally subject to town meeting approval of the list between the town and the 26.2 foundation. How did we get here? The town issued an RFP for the list of the property back in June uh, of 2019 uh, with a closing date of December 31st, 2019. Only one proposal was received from the 26.2 foundation. Uh, we included that proposal uh, and its details uh, in your meeting packet. And then following a very thorough uh, and objective evaluation by the procurement office, uh, the town has deemed the 26.2 foundation proposal most advantageous. Good. To the chair, I'd like to make that motion, if I may. I would love for you to make that motion, Mr. Katina. So, um, to the chair, I'd like to make a motion to, uh, uh, if, if, if Mr. Kamal, feel free to, to fix it, to... Uh, execute the RFP and, and bring uh, any um, questions to the uh, town meeting, uh, the annual town meeting. Is that good enough or you want to be too? I will give you the way then. Okay, thank you. This is a big step in this process. This is a this is going to be a wonderful addition to the town, this International Marathon Center. Is it me or is the six month RFP process uh, beyond the norm? Like that was more than welcoming for others to respond. Yeah. Yes, it twofold. One, we wanted to give enough notice uh, for uh, interested parties to respond and also the responses required heavy lifting on the part of the proponents, so we felt they needed more time to put together their proposals. Yes, yeah, so we, we went out of our way. I just want to make sure we were more than accommodating if anybody else wanted to get in on it. Where is 45 Main Street? 45 East Main. Yeah, East, oh, it says yeah, East, East Main. It said Main Street, and I was like, East Main, I thought it was, but I wasn't it's sure. where the hockey rink was going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, in terms of the motion, if the board is so inclined, move that the select board vote to approve of the award of the lease of property located at 45 East Main Street to the 26.2 Foundation, subject to, number one, the successful negotiation of a lease between the town and the 26.2 Foundation. Number two, the 26.2 Foundation providing information sufficient to satisfy the town with regard to the feasibility conditions set forth in Exhibit 2 of the request for proposals. And number three, town meeting approval. And further to authorize the town manager to negotiate a lease with the 26.2 Foundation as the board has orders requested with the assistance of town council. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Uh, I see Mr. Kilduff. I don't want you to come up here. We're running late. Show a thumbs up or thumbs down. Are you good with this? <laughs> <laughs> Hearing no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstain. It carries. Thank you. Okay. Um, item C. Are we? Do we need to do anything on C right now? We just talked about that. Mr. Kamala, your item C, the policy review of the marijuana testing lab. Is that? 
closing the barn door after the horses got out, or uh, do we have to do anything there? <laughs> yes. Um, we, we provided the board a draft policy for your review. Uh, hopefully, the board will be inclined to uh, put this on the agenda for formal adoption uh, at your next scheduled meeting. Yes, please do. Okay. Is that it? That's it. Liaison reports. Mr. Herr, from 30,000 feet. Nothing to report. Coutinho. I was at the, um, oh, come on, I'm sorry. I go to a lot of things. Let's go, sum it up. I went to growth study yesterday, and um, uh, Mr. Westerly did a great uh, uh, rundown on, on our water capacity, sewer capacity, <coughs> and uh, streets and sidewalks. Also, last Saturday, when there are people in, in this town that say it's changed and they don't like it and it's not the same, the ham and bean supper by the friends of Hopkinton. Supper. Supper. That's exactly what it was. It was just great. And that's, that's what Hopkinton Grange dinners must have been like 100 years ago. So when people say Hopkinton's changed, you've got go to gotta go look at the... Uh, uh, look around and find these events that have happened that, that really <laughs> are old time hockey to me. It was a heck of a lot of fun. Not a single kid had, the, had their phone out. No, th there were no iPads out. There was just singing and dancing and, and eating a lot of food. Well, so I recommend to your point, Mr. Catino, they have Civil War reenactments. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the town has changed, I assure you. The town has changed. It's still fun. It's, it's still fun. <laughs> that was <laughs> just fun. That was <laughs> just fun. <laughs> All right, Mr. Nasrullah. Mm -hmm. Quick update from the planning board. The uh, Legacy Farm Street Acceptance Plan is in, and it's with beta for review. Good. Awesome. That's good. So we're on track for May town meeting, you think? Yep. I think so. Yeah. Excellent. That's great. Yep. Roy turned in all the paperwork. Mary Jo. I went to the Martin Luther King ceremony at the Medsman oh, yeah. Temple, and it was just excellent. A uh, real family event. The children put on plays for us and did recitations and all kinds of things. Um, I spoke, the town clerk spoke, the superintendent of schools, and our uh, representative, our state representative, Carolyn Gaikama. And um, it was just a, a lovely, lovely day. Um, and then I went to the tax relief study committee meeting and they're a little bit short this year so if anybody really feels like they want to contribute something to that committee there are papers downstairs that you can fill out uh, and make a donation and they would really uh, appreciate it they've had to cut what they give to everybody by a little bit this year so I'm just reaching out for them excellent Mr. Catino, if you would be a lamb and give me a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain. It carries. Good night. <laughs>